What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is Muscle, and this is another Two Line Music Huts Entertainment Report podcast. And today we have a really special guest. Listen, if I sit here and name out everything that this man does in the entertainment field, this would take up the whole of the interview. So I'm just going to introduce him and we're going to go right through it. All right. You know, we have in the building today, we have Tarantula in the building today. What's going on, Big Boss? Yo, 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 yo. There, yeah, man. Live and in person for certain, you know? Definitely. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Entertainment Report podcast today. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm um, I'm a fan of the program. So, you know, watching some of the other episodes with some of my colleagues and friends, it was it was basically a matter of time, you know, before, you know, we were able to get together and line up the schedules and get it done. So glad to yeah. be here. Definitely. So, you know, we like to go right from the beginning and then bring it right up to 2022. So my first question for you is this. We're... Did you grow up and what type of child were you? Ah, um, born and raised in New York City. Um, mm-hmm. you know, born in the Bronx, I spent most of my, I would say, my upbringing in Queens and, um, you know, a couple of years in Jamaica. You know, that guy already, you have to, you have to go to Jamaica, I go spend time with grandma and get like a culture and brat up, see how far it is, isn't it? <laughs> you know, cause, you know, Yankee bad, pick me on this. You know, you have to get the like culture on your car, but, um, all jokes aside, I was, um, what kind of child was I? That would be a better question for my parents. But if I had to, if I had to step outside myself, I would say I was a outspoken, um, <laughs> rather outspoken, uh, kind of child who kind of, you know, went to the beat of their own drum. So that would be the best way. I mean, not much different than my adult life. Let's put it out. I hear you. And did you grow up with both parents, your mom and your dad? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And what were they into at that time there when you were growing up? Um, funny enough, my uncle on my mother's side was an avid music fan. And um, you know, he used to, you know, make I guess you could say mixtapes, even though that wasn't what they were called at the time, but his record collection was absolutely insane. Multiple genres. Uh much of my musical knowledge, you know, comes from him. My father also, same way you know, avid music fan, record collector. And my father had a sound system, mm-hmm. you know, um, named Asha High Power at the time. It was a, you know, a rubber dub sound, you know, live DJs on, you know, it's going to be starting kind of part thing one, you know? So when I'm about 10 years old, 11 years old, you know, early part, you know, when the sound just string up, I'm flipping over the records and mm-hmm. mixing down the artists and, you know, them kind of vibes, non-school nights, of course. And, um, yeah, so that that was that was the vibes, and then right when dance just I get sweet, I'm a little kid, so I had to go home, which mm-hmm. much to my chagrin. So, you know, like that. What was your what was your mom into? What was she doing? Um, you know, my mother was into banking, but music was music was a prevalent part of the household growing up. You know, there was always music playing. There was always you know little pop quizzes. You know, what artist is this? What song is this? What rhythm is this? You know, who produced this? You know, things like that. And, you know, my mother and father used to clash, you know, drawing for records and they'd going back and forth. And yeah, so I grew up watching all of this. So, you know, it was one of those kind of situations. And, you know, they're driving, I'm in the back seat, and my father's listening to old dances of like, you know, downbeat and, you know, jammies and, you know, them song, the Jaro and, you know, all kinds of like audios from like the eighties and even sometimes even the seventies, like some old Jara audio with like how Jim Kelly and then Monday at Beach, yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I kinda throughout my life there was a constant musical education going on. Going on throughout there. Okay, so you're absorbing the music from your parents, your uncles and stuff like that. What did you think yeah. you were gonna get into when growing up? Did you say you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or engineer? What do you want to be growing up? It was always, it was always music. Um, I don't even remember when I consciously chose it. I just feel like it chose me. Mm-hmm. Um, apart from that, it was sports. You know, I, um, I played American football, basketball. I ran track, you know, all of that good stuff. But after I tore my knee up, I kind of leaned forward into the music side of the thing, you know, playing instruments and all of that stuff. Like after I hurt myself playing football, I joined the band so I could stay on the field. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and still move with the team but yeah so 
Uh, music was always it though. Like it just, it just, you know, it was, was that's it, you could say. Mm-hmm. And what were, when you were in the band, what type of, what instrument were you playing at that time there? Alto saxophone. Mm. That was my first instrument. Started at nine. And then from there, I taught myself, you know, other instruments, clarinet, drums, trumpet, you know, things of that nature. But that was more on the side. Officially, it was saxophone. It was saxophone. There, you 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 joined you joined um the band and all that. Did you ever want to try being an artist or anything at the early stages in your when you're fooling around with music? Yes, um, yeah, I used to freestyle all the time. Um, you know, both rapping on the hip hop side and on the dance hall side. And that's how the name Tarantula uh, came about. You know, Spider-Man is my favorite, still is my favorite, you know, comic book character. You know what I mean? So it was a girl who gave me the name. She shall remain this. But um, <laughs> yeah, she gave me the name and it, it stuck. You know, and this yeah. is a time when this is a time when artists were naming themselves after animals. You know, you had your mad cabra, you had your mad lion. You know, so Mad Tarantula just kind of fell into play. Right. So Mad was, it actually had the Mad on it before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had it on there before, took it off, and then the Mad Spider part of it came much later, which we'll get to. We'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah. They're good. You got your name, you're doing your stuff. So did you actually get into any studio? Because you said your dad had a song. So as you're growing up now, did you start to play his song? You went out and played other song? Yeah. Was I your, played, how did you get in? I played his song, you know, when I could. You know, I was still a youth. So there was always the, you know, you can't reach at night time too late. You know what I'm saying? It was, you know, they were still parents. Let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, uh, as far as studios go, the first studio I ever you know, worked in was a studio by the name of Symbol Studio. This was in Queens, mm-hmm. on Jamaica Avenue. It's right in the basement of Original Records. I want to say that's 172nd or 171st in Jamaica Avenue. But um, yeah, it was in the basement. It was a dub plate studio. And, um, you know, I used to DJ every now and again. But for the most part, I was mixing down artists. This is like Yankee B, um, Snapper Chef, Major Fresh, you know, them kind of Queens artists. Them times Yankee B was the queen's artist at that time mm-hmm. this is like 93 94. okay because i know there was it's a, almost like queens had a completely different scene that w- what was happening in brooklyn and in brooklyn. very much so very much so very much so um new york city was on fire at the time as far as like bass hall and sound business was concerned and queens you know at this point in time 93 94 you have sounds like you know agony um which is now King Agony, but at the time it was Agony High Power. And, you know, that was Chin, um, same Irish and Chin, you know what I'm saying? That was Chin and Fata. You had sounds like Super Force. Yeah, Sharky was around since then. He's, um, he's a little older than most people know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Sharky was around them times. You had sounds like First Choice. Um, Pretty Posse was around. The Yellow Bird was, they were like the top juggling sound at the time. Um, you know, like you had a freak in Brooklyn, you had Pretty Posse in Queens, you had Addies in Brooklyn, you had Agony in Queens. You know, it was that them kind of counterpart kind of mm-hmm. business. And at the time I was running with a sound, I was running with a sound called Tech Life, you know, That's which right. is like basically my family. And you know, it was a bad little sound, you know, Queen sound. And, you know, we were gunning for everybody at the time. So, so you, you know, guys so actually it, clashed or was just more juggling with Tech Life? No, Tech Life was, it was built for war. There was, um, you know, because like I said, my father's son was more of a rubber dub kind of vibe. So now you're getting up to the dub play era and it's a whole different thing. So that's when I started running with Tech Life. And no, it was war. It was definitely war. So who were some of the early songs that you remember, or even if they had a name that Tech Life actually encountered at that time there? Ooh, um, let's see, Tech Life. Tech Life. At that time, sounds like Stereo King and um, Agony was supposed to happen, but it didn't end up happening. But definitely sounds like Stereo King and you know, your first choices and your Magnum Forces and your Super Dens. Um, Big Up Killer Boo, by the way, that was the original sound he was on, was Super Den. Was Super and, Den. Um, yeah, and um, you know, at that time, so many sounds, are, so it's hard to remember some of the names, but Super Force, you know, Sharky being another. Um, Soul Sonic, 
you know, so Sonic was around them times. Big up Skinny, anyway, I'm there. Um, yeah, it was it was a good time. It's a good time. I'm big up the Tech Life family. I still keep in touch with them to this day. Good to go. And how long how long were you on that song there for? Ah, I was running with Tech Life for basically right up until I moved to Florida, which was, you know, late 95. So just call it a year, if even that. You know, and I wasn't like a first string selector or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? I was, you know, just basically running with the sound. You know, there was Ramati, Andichin, Lion, Snagalexus, all of them were literally on the sound. And, um, you know, Tech Life used to go to Brooklyn and, and you know, and spar over there as well. PM, Bad Boy, you know, um, King Chilla and, you know, them sounds, things of that nature. So. Okay, so sounds basically within the same range of that sound there in particular. Didn't get to the Addies, the Earth Rulers, the LPs, the Soul Supremes, that type of level. No, it was on its way. It was on its way at a particular time. And, um, you know, then Florida happened. Mm -hmm. So. Not just for myself, but eventually for all of us. So, okay. <laughs> you know. So what was that like now? A kid that's living in Queens now is being transplanted to Florida. What was that experience like for you? Um, considering where I went in Florida, it was a culture shock. Um, you know, we were, you know, Melbourne, Palm Bay, which is like a, you could say a suburb of Orlando, so to speak. So you're going from a, you know, suburban to urban area to a more rural kind of area. Like most of it was bush at the time. And it was like, where the hell are we? <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, after a while, you know, because when you come from a city like that and you come to a more rural kind of area, things move at a slower pace here. So you will use that fast pace mentality that you have in New York and you start to create things, you know, you create your own fun source. So it was only a matter of time before we link up with other youths that move from New York down here. We start keeping dances. It was like a routine. Just know? like that. Because even that time, why did you guys decide to move from New York to Florida? Because that's a that's from far north to far south. True. But, um, well, there was family already here on my mother's side. Um, they moved down. That's one reason. Second reason is the weather. Um, as you know... You're you worry you're in the six, eh? So <laughs> hey, 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 so, yes, you know, yeah, you're in the six, eh? So um, you know how the winters can get. They're brutal, you know, especially then. So you know, before climate change and all of these things. So the weather, and then on top of that, you had a company. The name slips me. I think it was called General Development or something like that. They used to put ads in the paper in New York, cheap land in Florida. Mm -hmm. Buy some land and build your dream house for the summer, you know, come down to the sunshine. And, you know, they got a lot of people with that. And as a result, in this area, particularly, mm -hmm. there are a lot of transplanted New Yorkers. So it is what that, it is. That always caught me whenever you'd hear a clash in, in like Florida somewhere. And then the man said, Brooklyn, and the whole dance bus broke. I thought we're yeah. in Florida. No, there's a lot of transplanted New Yorkers here. Um, mm -hmm. A lot. A lot. So yeah, man. That's that's how that that's how Florida happened. Got like it. I said, it was a it was a culture shock at first, but you know, you you improvise and you adapt. So you make it happen. Here. So then how long did it take you to actually start to get back involved in some form of music by the time you got down to Florida now? Not very long, maybe three months. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we linked up with, you know, some of the youths and um they were already doing things in the area. And, you know, we just became friends and boom, boom, bang, and common interests. And within three months, we we're keeping parties and we're playing, you know, in various different places here, Orlando, Cocoa Beach, Fort Pierce, you know, places like that. And, um, you know, we even started to venture into the more traditionally hip hop clubs and we're playing the reggae sets there. Mm -hmm. um, this was early, I would say early 96, we're playing in Orlando alongside. There was a hip hop DJ cool. I want to throw this little tidbit in. There was a hip hop DJ cool running Orlando at the time. They were called the Hitmen. And mm -hmm. the three main members were um, DJ Nasty, DJ Caesar, and DJ Khaled. A lot of people don't know that, um, that Khaled actually bust in Orlando before he went to Miami. Miami. Bust again. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. This is why I like these conversations because everybody knows like a little tidbit or something, 
that totally mm -hmm. makes everything make sense. Absolutely. It's, it's a very small world. This industry is, it's like high school, man. Mm -hmm. Everybody you know, knows everybody. So then I know when you got to Florida, you started to play a song named King Chalice. Right. That took place, um, was playing a dance in Cocoa Beach. Um, you know, my father sound a couple other local sounds and Chalice was the headliner. And, you know, we did that routine in the earliest and, you know, Father Chalice approached me. I was like, yo, you know, you know what I'm saying? I'm in the process. I rebuild it. And, you know, I want to come play my song. So I mulled it over a little bit. And, you know, in March of 98, I decided to join, which was around the time when the rebuild was for the most part complete. So mm -hmm. you have Baga new song, brand new machine, like they rebuilt the sound and then you have new MC and we just went forward from there. So that's how, that's how the chalice thing happened. Guys, it was good times. Cause I know there, there's a couple, I think there's about three famous dances, King Chalice. I know one of them is David Radigan. Ah, uh, Memorial weekend. That was, I remember that date, like it happened yesterday. It was May 29th, 1999. And, um, yeah, that was a fun clash. It was six months after poison art clashed there. And it was in the same, it was in the same venue, Metro Skate Marine. And mm -hmm. the way it was set up was so great because, you know, the sound and everything was set up in the middle of the venue. So the crowd is surrounding you 360 degrees, almost like a boxing ring. And, um, and that dance was, it was a very, very fun dance. It was my first big league, you know, my welcome to the NBA moment, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, um. That clash was fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, everything played. Everything played. We went tune for tune for an hour and a half in that dance. Yeah, it was it was like half hour round. It was a half hour round, two 15 minute rounds, and then dub for dub for like an hour and a half. And everything playing our dub for dub. Old tune, new tune, singing tune, DJ tune, custom, everything played. There was no official declared winner. You know, there was no voting or nothing like that. It was just the dance. It just done. Everybody's outside. And for hours, people are arguing in the parking lot over who won and who lost and who win and who lose. But was that fun. was, that's what made those clashes, we'll call them clashes, dance back then, so interesting because there wasn't really a trophy at the end. There wasn't really a referee. It's just you go in and do what you do and every. And everybody's just going to leave talking until the next dance again. Until the next dance again. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes, sometimes the argument don't get settled in the first dance. I need our next one. You know what I mean? And the people in Bal feet back. But that was, that was a fun dance. It was a very, very fun dance. And King Chalice had the tune that could stand up to David Radigan like that, boss? At the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we were... We we're pretty loaded for that dance. Um, yeah, Father Chalice went nuts as far as like spending was concerned. Yeah, it was it was our vibes. Yeah. Big up David Radigan, man. Anyway, yeah, it was our vibes. Sure. Um, yeah, we were loaded. Like at that point in time, we could have played anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were loaded, loaded. And it's like one of those songs where it almost reminds me of another song named Um, I think Black Rose from down there. This is a song you've never heard of before, but when you hear a, a, a cassette or a CD with this song, it's like, where the hell did this song come from, boss? Ironically, ironically, shortly after the Chalice Radigan dance, that, call it the summer of 99, is when Black Rose was originally beginning to build. You know what I mean? So, you know, big up the whole family over there. And, mm -hmm. You know, and they, they, built, they built up and they became a force. A bad, bad song. I used to get enough CDs from down there. There was this guy, I forget the CD man that was in that area there. He would send me Black Rose and every sound you could think about Black Rose is playing with at that time there. Uh, was it Roughneck? It wasn't Roughneck. It was somebody else. It was, I can't remember. Roughneck, I know Roughneck, but this was like a one away man. And I said, this guy has a gazillion Black Rose, Black Rose and Bodyguard, Black Rose and Black Rose and everybody you could think about. And if mm -hmm. it wasn't for this man, you would have never heard those dances before. Understood. Understood. Yeah. Uh, after, 
after Chalice ended up, um, after Chalice ended up cooling off for a little while, Black Rose became the, um, became the preeminent Orlando sound, especially as far as clashing was concerned. Black culture was around. Absolutely. But Black Rose was more at the forefront after Chalice, you know, no, for sure. With, um, Ch with, um, King Chalice, we could either go Black Cat or we could go Bodyguard. Which one you want to go? Black Cat. That dance came first. Okay. That was, that was late August. It was a few days before my birthday. Um, late August 99, I want to say 25th or something like that. Don't quote me. But, um, that particular dance, um, that was a, that was another welcome to the NBA moment as far as you know, playing Panta because at that particular time, you know, mid to late nineties, if you wanted to bust as a big sound, you had to play black cat first. Mm. And if you couldn't kill black cat, you wasn't a big sound. So that was the, you know, they were like the entry level. This is before world clash, before mm -hmm. Panta became the giant that he is now. He was still a giant, but he was the, um, you know, he was the one the that beginner was the giant. Of, yeah, he gave sounds of blood, the young sounds mm -hmm. that were coming up. So before the other big sounds would take dances with you, they would pay attention to what you're doing with Panta, and then they would mm -hmm. go from there. You know what I mean? But Panta never business. It was a war, so it, it was what it was. So we played that dance, and we won by a landslide. Okay. And that was when, when that cassette went out, that's when other sounds and promoters around the place started to take us a little bit more seriously, not just a hometown Orlando sound. It was like, all right, these dudes are coming. Mm -hmm. And, um, the bodyguard dance happened shortly thereafter. Um, that dance wasn't very well attended. The promoter tried to throw it together last minute, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. but, um, nonetheless, it was, it was a fun night, you know, just going back and forth with links. You know I mean? We just kind of just run some chew, you know what I mean? It wasn't really like a, we didn't go super hardcore. It wasn't, the audience wasn't there for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was still a fun time. Man. Yeah, man, you're ready, man. Yeah, man, you're ready, Rasta boy, you're ready. You know, so we're not chewing and boom, boom, boom. And then um, sh shortly after that, mm -hmm. Fort Lauderdale, little club, um, name of the venue was called Bumblebee. Long time Fort Lauderdale residents, so I know that place. So in the dance was was Chalice, um, Kilimanjaro with Trupa, mm. Travelers with Juxi Kilo. Yes. And Trupa has a way where everybody's juggling and everything's all good. And when Trupa starts to get bored, he's just gonna flip. So Trupa mm. flips on everybody. And war start. <laughs> Don't box so me. War start. And you know, we were gunning and everybody's gunning. And then Juxi Killer was kind of, <sighs> let's just say, and this is no diss to him because he's an MC I selected at our rate, but he was kind of lagging behind. We had the element of surprise on our side. So when we had dropped certain songs, Monday, I said, whoa, you know? And you know, Troopers, Trooper, this is Jaro we talking about. This is two <laughs> weeks before 99 World Clash, you know? Mm. So we playing, you know, and this time we're loaded with stink. So we're playing and Trooper got to open the world clash box and start playing a certain, a certain song. And, you know, and then Jukes the Killer trying to keep up a little something at the time. You know what I'm saying? Because Travelers, you know, they were up to the time, but not really up to the point. It's just a mass there. So, mm -hmm. you know, all of a sudden Jukes of them are playing. They're about to draw a tune, speech on neck, back of fling, boom, dance done. And... Trooper, after the dance, is batting up the cassette, man. I think it was Roughneck at the time. It was like, yo, don't put out the audio. Because I may have work clash, I come up, man. I don't want to see them once and have certain sound. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that was the, that was, that was really the moment where not just other people, but I realized, okay, I can hang with these guys that I've been listening to on day. <laughs> yeah, I can hang with them. Because I'll never, that feeling of actually, listen to your cassettes those times and then actually standing up with them in a dance, not even to juggle, to clash. That feeling is mind blowing and mind boggling at the same time. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was, um, it was low key intimidating at first, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, that's how it is when you're, you know, for the first go on. And then after you get your first big forward, all the butterflies go, they just disappear with the forward. And then it's like, all right, I'm in the fight now. And at that point, it's just, it's just instinct. Let's go with Tinder. At this time, were you talking on King Callis or you were selecting the songs at this time? I was emceeing. I was emceeing. Um, that, that's how I made my name first as an MC. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes I would play by myself, but for the most part, I was an MC on Chalice. What got you into MC and then who were you really looking up to first before you really got into it? Ooh, um, on the juggling side, it had to be Rory. Of um, course. Everybody growing up at that time, ah, it's and shine, you know, like it had to be Rory. Um, yeah. Clash wise, Clash wise, my biggest influence was Babyface. Was Face? Yes. By far, mm-hmm. by far, 100%. Babyface was my biggest influence. Addis was my son, you know what I mean? And on Big Up Earth Rule, I rated them heavy too. But Babyface was, it was like, yeah, I want to play like him. You know? What was it about Face in particular where you said, damn on your butt? Presence. Face had a presence and, um, you know, musical knowledge, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um you know, the way, the way he carried himself, but it was just a presence, man. It's like, you know, as a celebrity, I see around the sun and the man have on him, Prada shoes and, you know, Chris Linen. You don't normally see selectors dressing like that. So it was just, it was one of them kind of things that, like just the swag overall, you know, just that whole bad Rasta swag. And the fact that, the fact that he wasn't born in Jamaica, you know, was our next thing too. You know what I'm saying? Even though he wasn't a Jamaican like myself, but he wasn't born in Jamaica. That helped as well. Cause at the time, you know, there was a, I don't want to say a separation, but a little bit of a separation between born Jamaicans and everybody else. So for, sure. you know, for, for him to be a non born Jamaican, I'm going to do it. You know, him and Lee Major for that matter, but Babyface was, Babyface was it as far as clash in mm-hmm. New York. When Babyface was the one to, to emulate, you know what I mean? And even like I was saying with Queens, like with Agony, you know, a lot of things they emulated from Addies. As a matter of fact, when Addies became King Addies, Agony shortly thereafter became King Agony. You know, makes sense, makes total yeah. sense. You could, you could ask Chin for the rest of the story. That's how I, I don't worry. Don't worry. I had, we had Chin and Chin told me that little piece there. So we, we got it. You guys go yeah. check out the Chin interview. It's a two part yeah. when you guys finish this tarantula right. interview. Right. That's, that's how I remember it. So mm-hmm. because but, um, the thing with face was especially cause back then I was playing song in the early nineties and stuff. Like, and he, cause I'm born in Canada. So he gave foreign kids the permit and the license to actually play a song and be bad at playing this song. Ah, exactly that. Exactly that. You know, because Addis was that defender, you know, when the yard sound and used to come up that we all listening to on cassette. Addis was the one to, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, man. Nah, Maybe, face, you know, face was it for me as a you. Yeah. Face was it. You know, big up Lion Face and OM them, and that's Teach. You know sure. Mean? Even yeah, because you said on the, one of the, the King Chalice dance, I think it was a black cat dance or trooper dance where they're calling you Rasta. How long now have you been growing your locks? <laughs> I started in January of 95. So you're talking January coming on me 20, no, 28 years. Mm. Yeah, so 27 and change. Yeah. What, what made you decide to wrestle? My father, my father's a Russ. Um, Fathers are us from a long time. So it was like a, it was just a natural progression. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't force us to do it as youths. It was just one of those things. He was just like, yeah, I knew you were going to do it. It was only a matter of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And was it easy being a rust that time there? Because remember, you're supposed to be saying more Holy King Celestia at that time there and actually playing and killing song. How was that for you at that time there? Which baby face made Babyface kind of made it cool, the 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 bad Rasta kind of you know image. He made it cool, you know what I mean? Because this is we're, we're talking when I'm growing up, ninety three, ninety four, and you know like Capleton 
just harass at that time, you know, this Marcus and all them stuff, they just coming out and that wave was just starting to emerge. And face made it cool to be, you know what I'm saying, as a rust with your locks by and I said, hey, boy, like you made it cool to, you know, to to harness that that level of aggression. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Which at the time one could say that it was what's the word I want to use? Unbecoming mm-hmm. of a of a rust at that time. You know what I'm saying? It was more, you know, blessed love man. You know what I'm saying to you. But nonetheless, you know, face made that, you know, cool. And then eventually Chin Rasa and also, you know, on the Queen side made it cool. But Face definitely made it cool, you know, because at that time, you know, Bubba, you know, Bubba Shanti was always there. You know what I'm saying to you? But they emerged more when Kirtan and Sisla. That's when it really came to the forefront in the mm-hmm. But before that, it was more Naya Bingi and 12 Tribe. You know, more so even 12 Tribe, you know, because I know Naya Bingi not even mixed with music more than so much. Okay. But yeah, man. So Face made it cool. That Bad Rasta image. Baby Face made that. He made it okay. You know what I'm saying? It was a path that I was able to step in as a result of him paving that road. It makes sense, dear. So you're on King Chalice. You did your stuff. How long were you on King Chalice for? Realistically, just under two years. Okay. Like the pinnacle of the sounds on of the sounds history. Um the sound was built in ninety two. Yeah, ninety two. Ninety one, ninety two, call it that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was only just about two years or so, 98 to call it 2000. Okay, so then I guess this is, yeah, you you clash with Trooper, you clash with Black Hat, you clash with Radigan, but you're still on this nice little bad soul, all right? What was the transition like now from the nice little bad soul to the big bad poison dart? What ended up happening was, you know how that time was. Um streets was hot you know and certain little things took place mm-hmm. legally wise and you know what i'm saying to the old chalice thing kind of had to cool off among other things but i don't want to get into that um at the time it was basically a sound to play and ironically i had a relationship with babyface at the time I also had a relationship professionally with Redman from Poison Art. We used to juggle at an event called Link Up Sundays. Mm. It was Chalice and Poison Art every Sunday. So, you know, Redman would select and I would MC. You know, Kirk wouldn't be there. Mm. You know, Kirk, <laughs> he's going to laugh when he, um, when he hears this, but Kirk didn't start coming to the Sunday night until after I bust, you know? <laughs> I'm putting it out there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, Red, Redman and I were there building the thing. And um, yeah, when it busts and link up Sunday start tech life now, then Kirk is in King. Yeah, so it became after the chalice thing happened, it became a um a situation of do I play the big Florida sound, poison art locally? It's right here. You know, it's only another hour or so drive from Orlando. Or do I take the actual chance and find my way to play the King song? Mm-hmm. And uh, it just made sense to stay in Florida. Mm-hmm. And it was, in a lot of ways, it just felt like the better option, you know? And looking in hindsight, it absolutely was. But, um, you know, Big Up Lion Face, um, we discussed it very briefly. And, um, yeah, we just, the transition to Poison Art just made sense. I played, first date I played was um, in New York. Okay. It was May of 2000. It was in mm-hmm. Brooklyn. The place was called BEC. It was Steely Bashman who kept the dance, as a matter of fact. Um, mm-hmm. It's on the line up. And to f- show you how history works out funny, my first dance on Poison Dark was Trooper's last dance on Jaro. <laughs> That's crazy. Just to, show you, just to show you how life, you know, mm-hmm. how it works. Grand opening, grand closing. And um, 
Yeah, it was his last dance on Jaro. He made the announcement. I was like, yeah, man, boom, boom, bang, me, I build my sound, you know, sound trooper, blah, blah, blah. If I come, you know, and from that point on, it was just a dance. And, you know, as in trooper fashion, him flip. Of course. And, uh, yeah, it's his trooper. He's going to do that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we gunned it out. Um, Exodus Nuclear was on the dance too. Big up Bellevue. Bellevue was playing Exodus Nuclear at the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, we gunned it out. It was, you know, it was fun times. And again, my welcome to the NBA moment, you know, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Now imagine, this is my first dance on the sound. I'm not even on the sound a month. And I'm already <laughs> with Trooper Kilimanjaro. So it was like, okay, you're this is big, big business now. This ain't no, you're going to juggle for a little bit. No, nah, no, nah, you're going, you're getting thrown straight into the fire. Yeah. This is guns out. Yeah, that's what it was. And um, it was an adjustment. Mm-hmm. It was an adjustment. It was like it was like playing college ball and then going to the pros in that as far as the difference, you mm-hmm. know, just being thrown straight into the game like that. You Even know, but, though you did clash him already on Chalice, this is which, still now a completely different level. Right, which made it easier to adjust. It, it wasn't like, oh my God, it's true. But it was like... Man, I just roughed you up a few months ago. Let's go. You know what I mean? It was a different attitude, but yeah, it, it was still, it was a learning curve, mm-hmm. a learning curve. Cause when you're playing on a sound like Poison Art, that Poison Art had already made a international, you know, multinational, international, however you want to put it. They made a name, mm-hmm. in, um, call it 96, 97. And, um, you know, here we are 2000, the sound is. It's established, but it's going this way. And um, so it's a different level of expectations. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, let's see what this kid's going to do. Because we already know Kirk, you see, and Redman are capable. So let's see what the kid has. And that's what it was. Crazy. So wh- what are some other early dances you remember, clashes in particular, you remember on Poison Art? August 2000. Jamaica, Walla Abba, Ascot Lan, um, Paisendad, Kilimanjaro, Caveman, mm. Independence Weekend. Worst time to clash Kilimanjaro. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jamaica. But nonetheless, we're dead there. And you know, we're going to tell it. And um, police ended up locking off the dance in the second round, which, um, you know, Let's just say for sound's sake, they did lucky uh, with its trap and we was ready, you know? Um, but yeah, Freddie was playing the sound at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, that was my, well, we had a dance. We had a dance in Spanish town with them a few weeks prior. Um, mm-hmm. That was just a chocolate thing. But that was, let's say that was my second time. My first time seeing the sound in action clash wise and you know, the first time we actually played on Jaro sound, that's okay. when I understood why Trooper has so much vibes. Because the way how that sound play, mm-hmm. yeah, the little the little gray boxes. You know, what I mean, I think the 12, yeah. 12 gray boxes. Yeah, Jaro sounded great back mm-hmm. then. So, but um, yeah, it was um, that was a dance that was shaping up to be something special. But police said lucky tough, and you know, the dance never really got to, you know. And what is it like now in your mind? You're, you as the firing kid, now you're in the motherland of sound clash and sound business. What was it like to hear yourself on that microphone outside in Jamaica? Nothing like it. Nothing at all like it. It was, I felt like I made it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it's very, very different from, um, you know, playing indoors. Now, don't get me wrong. We have outdoor lawns and stuff like that in Florida, but it's not the same. Mm-hmm. You know, as yeah, you know, it just felt right. Um, just very, very different. It's nothing at all like it. Um, shortly thereafter, maybe, maybe a week, a week, yeah, a week after, Squidgy kept his anniversary dance. Okay. Um, yeah. Funny enough, it's the same weekend base obviously does sound just now. But you know, late August, but it was Squinchy's anniversary weekend back there. Still like 
year to year. The dance was Golden Grove, Golden Grove Entertainment Center, same dance. Mm -hmm. It was Base Odyssey, Renaissance, Stone Love, Heisenberg. I went by myself. Yeah, this was the first, um, this was the first Poison Art day. Mm -hmm. I went by myself. Um, so it's me and all them damn dub boxes. I don't even want to. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so the dance I won and bass out of the string up. The one rack is there playing good. Stone love string up. Water post and a man now playing on his own. Mm. So it was Stone Love playing on Stone Love song and like Renaissance and myself playing on Bass Odyssey song. Selectors for Stone Love was Billy Slaughter and Nico Bamba. Mm. You know, when those two are in town, it's a different energy. Listen to me very carefully. Nico and I had already had a couple skirmishes in Tampa at that point in time because the thing with Nico is, I'm big him up, by the way. The thing with Nico was, Nico was about this close to playing Poison Art at one point in time. Okay. Uh, Car Nico did want war. You know, he was a father. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, so what ended up happening was, I don't know what possessed Nico. And if he watches this interview, he's gonna laugh. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, rest in peace to Squingy. I don't know what possessed Nico that night in the morning, in the later part of the dance, everybody done have them fun. And Nico decides he wants to play me. Correction, Poison Dart, mm -hmm. Sizzler for Sizzler. This is 2000. Bro. At that point in time, you have two Sizzler so on a foreign. Mm -hmm. Poison Dart and Super Fresh. Mm. You know, know, you know, you know this. It's well known. And then in Jamaica, you know, you have your jar or you have your cave man, you have your um turbophonic, they were still around at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know what anyway. <laughs> Sizzler to Sizzler happens, and after about nine or ten of them, it was embarrassing. Squinchy just picked up the microphone, took it out of my hand, I said, Yo, Miko dead man, it done. Or bow we are. Done. That's it. Done. And drop the mic. <laughs> and that was it. The dance is over. The body say, oh yeah. Needless to say. Needless to say, and Kirk gonna laugh when he used to. <laughs> needless to say, not even a week later, by the time I get back to Florida, mm -hmm. Kirk you see there's a call from Father Bo. Yo, you need to control your selector in a road boy, cause yeah, we select alongside the sword and I'll I'll go on war on one bag of sitting. And um, you know, if that I go continue, then we could lay a fee and just with business relationship as far as certain be it done. It it became a thing. Let's just mm -hmm. put it that way. With poisoner and stone love. It became a thing as far as tell your selector to calm down or, you know, those dates that, you know, we give you, you know, when you have to keep your dots and you might not get them no more. It, it was one of those kind of mob boss kind of vibes. But mm -hmm. because at that time, you know, like I said, it's 2000. It was that time frame when you keep a stone love dance and it guarantee for round them. 100%. So, right. So with that being said, that was a um yeah it, it was a thing but i laughed about it you know because it was just the way i looked at it was anywhere i see nico is on you know what i mean that's what it was and mm -hmm. we bucked up on a couple more dances and you know <laughs> just you know skirmish skirmish always broke out but we would just make sure that part don't necessarily reach the audio mm -hmm. and uh, yeah because he was nico was the one that would always Slipping a cuss word when he really got hyped on Stone Love, he would slip oh, in one and two. You tell it. This is this is part of the reason why Father Paul was not having it. But yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, because apparently, apparently he must have got into a skirmish with um with Cinemax shortly mm -hmm. thereafter, and then that's when the whole rumor of suspension and all that other stuff started to surface. And I don't know 
what the truth is with that. But that's what happened. That's the rumor that came out shortly after that Cinemax dance. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, man, Nico, Nico, Nico's our bad selector. What? Our bad selector. What? He's, I call him the father for Richie Feelings and those type of selectors that came after the fact. Agree. Mm-hmm. Agree. Agree. Let's say when it was there. Okay. When you, when you got to Poisoner, was Dopes and Bobby Chin still playing Poisoner at that time there? Yep. Yep, that was the starting five. Bobby Chin, Super Dupes, Redman, Kirk, C and myself. Mm-hmm. That was the starting five. And me being the kid, I was the youngest on the sound at the time. So I was the kid. And um, those were fun times because we were clashing and we were juggling. Mm-hmm. And it was just, you know, every weekend we're arguing over who's going to fly where. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was great times. You know what I mean? Um, and... Yeah, at this point in time, they are on Black Chinese three. Mm-hmm. And they were working on four. And, you know, they were using the Poison Art dubs to make the remixes and boom, boom, bang, bang, bang. And um, we had all of those remixes, but we had them with Poison Art's name in them. You understand what I'm saying to you? Because it was our dub Africa. So mm-hmm. the juggling dates that we had with Books and we was lit. So, um, and then it just got, so this, by the time black Chinese four came out, mm-hmm. it was basically a wrap at that point. It was just too big. They, they had to just start taking some baits and, and going to make some appearances because it was just too, it, it was crazy. It was crazy. The it CD was, game was crazy there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was insane. And, um, dopes on. Um, Indirectly, no, inadvertently, inadvertently, Dukes invented splicing in a sense. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I, t- listen, I, I need to hear this. I told you I was going to talk my shit. Inadvertently, <laughs> it wasn't like a, it was an unintended consequence because, you know, you're making the remixes with the dub acapellas, right? Ours, taking sound name out. So other engineers is doing the math and they're like, wait a second. So don't laugh, Capella. Take song with O. <laughs> so you can't take next song. i um, put song yeah, in. Thus, splicing. Bro. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like I said, it was an unintended consequence. Now, granted, mm-hmm. Dupes wasn't the only one making remixes at the time. Obviously, you had DJ Kareem and, you know, Renaissance and these things. Mm-hmm. Right. But I'm just saying, at this point in time when Black Chinese was, the remix thing was at an all-time high, you know, you had obsession of North Doom. It became a thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I think from that point on is when splicing really started to become prevalent, you know? The dub acapella started to float around because what ended up happening, you know, rhythm changing. And the big up Lion Face, by the way, because mm-hmm. he was the one that was in the studio plugging in and plugging out like you know one five spot one side really fun mix. But anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it was an unintended consequence of remixing, splicing. Yeah. That's my opinion. I because be they figure they figure if I could take out a voice, I must could put one back in. Precisely that. Mm-hmm. And you know, it became a thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you start hearing you start hear some other sound, I play some dub. Whether it be some killer or some Kyokutan or whatever kind of dub, and you hear in the intro and you recognize the intro because it sounds like your dub, but then you hear another sounding call and you're like, hold on a second. <laughs> what I'm, what? You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. that's when it, and it's like, yeah, this is, this is kind of getting out of control. At this point. Yeah, no, that one point, Splice Dubs was like freaking completely out of control at one point. Completely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And um, yeah. That's my that's my belief. It was an unintended yeah. consequence of remixing. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. As that got more prevalent, splicing got more prevalent as well. Got you. You're on the big heavy song now. You and Nico buck up. You're doing you and Trooper. All this stuff is going on. When was the first time you got a Ross kick? No, playing Poison Dirt. That came later mm-hmm. because after that dance with um um Stone Love, we clashed Panther again. 
I Clash Panther again, but we Clash Panther in wait a bit, Christmas Eve. Okay. And we won, we won that dance. Um, that was, that was my first like hardcore deep country, you know, Clash Panther, you know, all our boys, but it's not, it's country, but it ain't country. Like, yeah. You know, like we was in a yam field in Kulani, like wait a bit, like in the bush. And, um, that was an experience as well because it was a, it was a thing where, you know, you, you get that real Jamaican vibes, that clash vibes, where it's like, you know, everybody's outside till the far and so on reach. And then they're coming in, cause they want to hear you you know what I mean? So, but yeah, we, we did good in that dance. We won that dance. Mm -hmm. Um, and then 2001 comes along and April of 2001, first weekend in April, mm -hmm. we play one on one with Mighty Crowd. Take your time and tell me what you remember about this dance. Because remember, Mighty Crowd, there were two, just one. There was two of them. There was two dances. There was one in yes. Atlanta on Friday, yes. with Serenity, and then there was one in, in Orlando on Saturday. The Atlanta dance is kind of like a blur. Mm -hmm. Like I knew Crown won, but I vaguely remember what really took place. Mm -hmm. The Orlando dance, however, that dance sticks out in my memory like it just happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, we're there, and it was a very interesting time because this is the first time Mighty Crown has clashed mm -hmm. in Florida, period. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... You know, at the time. So, you know, they just were Clash 99, then Boss Mighty Crown is the big sound. You know, they've come to Florida to juggle, obviously. Orlando to juggle, yeah, but why is not Mighty Crown? Big dance. Hmm. So we're there, very well attended dance, dance round. So we're playing first round, we get the forward then, you know, place a shell. With. Second round, same thing. I noticed something very interesting when Crown was playing. Mm -hmm. They weren't really doing too well. Um, I skipped the dance, but I'll get back to that other dance in a second. They weren't really doing too well, but the crowd didn't boo. Mm -hmm. They were just there, just looking. Like, you know, it, it, I, I don't want to say fascination, but somewhat. Because it, it wasn't a situation like they were booing. There was no forwards. But there were no boos. The people them were just quiet, just looking like, like bated breath, like they were waiting for something to happen. Mm. Same mes they were more mesmerized. In a sense, yes. Mm -hmm. So we're there, we are going, you know, dance is going well. I'm feeling great. I'm like, yo, we got them on the ropes. Mm, we about to <laughs> Yes. Right? End of the second round, they play a city high. They play city high on that group on Doug. Mm -hmm. Well, we was into the movie sound. I don't remember the lyrics, but they got a nice forward for that. Okay, mm -hmm. first forward, then go. We come back in third round, <laughs> and um, they come back in third round. They're doing okay. They're doing all right. End of the third friggin' round. <laughs> These guys play one fucking. I said I wasn't gonna curse this interview, but right here is why I gotta curse. One fucking dub play. Mm -hmm. And Wyclef. Mm -hmm. As soon as the guitar yes. once that started, the forward just started from the back. Mm -hmm. And it's just a wave. Yes. A wave. You know, say, what's up, man? It's Wyclef John representing Sammy T, Simon, Mighty Crown. And the guitar and people's like, oh shit. You just see, just imagine a thousand people, twelve hundred people with the same oh shit face. <laughs> Bro, you see when the man come in, I say, someone please go and now shit on down. Forward starts to it, the, the tidal wave is coming. You see the next line? Tell them place and I get my the wave just crashed. <clears throat> It was like a tidal wave of forwards just <laughs> crashed onto the stage. Mm -hmm. Bro, I needed that lesson. That was the first. That I'd never seen a dance switch so quick mm -hmm. in my life. 
By the time I walk onto the stage with the mic in my hand, by the time I reach the front of the stage, the forward became a wave of dinginess. It was just like, yo, on a dead. I was like, yo, on a real level, once. Yes. <laughs> that was basically over after that, as far as these people were concerned. And we played, we got to our third round. Um, tried the counteraction with Batman now down 911 er, elephant man. No, that did not work because the people that were just like, you're on a dog, you're, you're yeah. done, you're dead, who are you dead? Who are right. you dead? Tune for tune, come back and forth. They played a Marcy and Griffiths Bob and the combination. That was it. That, that was, was it. when that combination was brand new. A lot of songs did not have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know, Cataract had just bust with it, you know, and you know, downbeat that. But that was it. That was it. <laughs> that was it. That was it. That was it. That was like that was my first huge L. Yeah. You know, you're not you're on a nice little run and you kick some soul and you're going and yes, and you're feeling good and then bam, you just get that that back down to earth like these fucking assholes. They just they just beat us. And how did it songs. make you feel now? Uh, remember, you're riding high. You're the new youth on the song. You, you, you've been here a little bit now, but you're still the new young youth hype youth on the song. How I was barely on the sound. I was barely on the sound for a year, so I'm still the new kid. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it there was there wasn't social media at the time, mm -hmm. like no Facebook or nothing like that. DHR was the social media yes, at the time. Yes, yes. And it was just it was brutal. Why is not dead? Nah, 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 nah. The dread not make it. City to get rid of him, I am shy him, see the dance, X, Y, and Z, us, they down close. Right? After that dance, now we go play a couple of dances in Montreal. And at this point in time now, on a local scale, I'm heavy into the hip hop production, you know, local, you know, scene. I'm rapping and making beats. Okay. So you were nature. you were doing a lot of you were selecting song you're doing production and you're rapping all at the same in the same time right so june of 01 i take a hiatus i call it a leave of absence mm -hmm. from the sound um and we're putting out a mixtape at this time a mix cd call it that and you know we're doing the master p hustle pressing up a whole bunch of them and selling them out the trunk Mm -hmm. doing local shows, open mics, boom, boom, bam. We hustling with this. And um, meanwhile, Poison Art is still going on, going on. And at this point in time, I'm doing that. And that's, you know, it's Guan. And we, I mean, we didn't sell a million copies, but we, we didn't lose money. Let's put it that way. You know what I'm saying? We, <laughs> we broke even. Um, and at the same time, I'm playing my local scene, but I'm playing the white clubs now, the pop clubs, mm -hmm. the, um, the non-urban venues. And, you know, you learn a whole different style of interacting with crowds. And it became an interesting contrast because I'm bringing the dance hall energy to that kind of mm -hmm. venue. But at the same time, I'm learning how to speak to these people, which would serve me well at a later chapter in this interview. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward, World Clash 2003 happens. You know, Kurt did his interview. Poison Art wins US Rumble. Final mm -hmm. scratch, one turntable. They win. World Clash is the next week. Mm -hmm. They go, they do all right. And um, Kirk MCs, Panther wins the Clash. After the dance, Chin and everybody is like, yo, to play this circuit, you got to go get Tarantula. And, you know, called, had a conversation, boom, boom, boom. Come back. I was like, all right, make me an offer I can't refuse. All right, leave of absence done. I'm back on the job. Right? So, January of 2004, <laughs> City of Orlando. We're, uh, before I get to that, 
<laughs> There's a clash I forgot about in 2000, and I'm mad I forgot about it. It was Poison Art versus Base Odyssey one on one. That's what, okay. You see, that's what that's I was going to ask you. Like, about, yeah, I forgot about that dance as I was going through the little timeline. That was June, maybe the 25th or something like that. I don't remember the actual date. Nonetheless, it was in South Beach, Miami. Um, very fun dance because all of us for both sounds were there. Hmm. So on the wall, like, let's say this is the stage on this wall over here. You have Squingy, Mark, Kirk, C, Redman. Mm -hmm. They're on the wall mm. watching the new kids play each particular sound. Mm -hmm. On Bass Odyssey, it's Skinny and Worm mm. versus Poison Dart with myself and Dopes. Yeah. Dopes, Dopes was playing now. Okay. Dopes was selecting, and yeah. I was MC. And Throughout the rounds, neck and neck, boom, it's a fight. Everybody's excited, crowds into it. Al Pacino's in the crowd heckling that no neck mother. Anyway, so, <laughs> and anyway, so he's heckling me, which, you know, it's all good. It's part of the sport. Um, Squinji comes in the second round and makes one speech. Mm. Uh, the man makes one speech. Mm -hmm. Oh, my brother, he makes one speech. Touch it. <laughs> Yo, when I said the place bust, the place bust, the place bust, the place for the man turned the dance instantly with that one speech. Mm. He made the speech, he got the forward, he gave the mic back to Skinny, and he went back against the wall with the biggest smile on his face, like he's a walk, are you? <laughs> you thought you were so getting like, away. No. Exhale, I'm your fuck, are you? And he just had that 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 slight grin that squidgy be having on his face and i'm just like oh for here we go so he puts us in a little bit of a of a ditch to climb out of now and by time tune for tune come because at this point bass odyssey didn't have the belly song yet mm -hmm. you know but we did so you know what i'm saying so now the speeches is coming oh oh you know on a belly and look on this you can't make it up one me i'm skinny one me i'm worm on the sound now on a belly like you know forward you know so we ended up winning the dance. Yo, Mark was vex after the dance. Mark did vex, Mark did vex, Mark did vex. I'm sure Kirk talked about this. Mm -hmm. And we all got in the same van and we drove to Tampa afterwards. Because we had yeah. another dance to play the next night. And, um, you know, and, you know, it was our vibes. But yeah, back to this Mighty Crown situation now. And um, fast forward after that, we're at January of 04. Yeah, that's where we are. Um, Poison Art versus Black Cat. Black Cat is now the world class champion, defending world class champion. They're on fire. Wanta is becoming the giant that he is now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at this point, he was a one star general. He didn't become the seven star yet. <laughs> and um, so we destroy him in the dance. It was embarrassing. Yeah. Like it was a floor mopping. Poison was, with, this was a one on one poisoner. One on one. Mm -hmm. One on one. It was it was a it was one sided from start to finish. Mm. By the time the cartel tech gunshot dropped, it was over. That was the final nail yes. in the coffee. Yes, bro. Right? Yes. Yes. Now let me show you how Panther is a complete <laughs> fascino. Bro. We get to England for UK Cup. This is April. This is three months later. April of 04. UK Cup. Now we on the radio. One extra. Rubber ranks. So rubber ranks goes to Panther. So, um, so you guys, I, I, I heard you guys had a clash, yeah? It was, um, it was Poison Dark and yourselves in, in, in Orlando, yeah? Yeah, yeah. but you know, sound like a juggling dance and Hillary in a clash, yeah? I'm sitting there at the radio station like this piece of shit. Man. You know what I'm talking about? You know, I'm just trying to go juggling now. So I know they're ready to go out. We would have so much fun. I just saw you go. I'm just like, yo, this one. Bro, you have the you know rocky voice <laughs> down pat, bro. <laughs> bro, the odd, bro, the absolute audacity. He just brushed the winner's side. I was like, no, nah, man, I did get it. No, nah, man, I'm going to go. We have all sorts of stuff. You know what I'm you know, I said, I didn't really worry about that wicked man. I don't know what's that. 
I'm just like, oh boy, here we go. That's when you understand that Panta is the ultimate craftist, bro. Ultimate. That, yo, the man crying beyond belief. Mm-hmm. So, UK Cup happens now. And um, at this point in time, this is the biggest crowd I've ever seen. Okay. Um, it was an ocean. Mm-hmm. Hackney. Mm-hmm. Uh, 04. Mataran. Uh, was Mataran, Mighty Crown, Black Cat. Our, us, One Love, and Classic. Yes. Manchester. Yes. yes. So, you know, mind you, this is 04. George Bush is president. Mm. We're in the UK. They're not really fans of Bush over there. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not saying this had anything to do with anything, but when the American sound was introduced, the crowd let us know how they felt mm. about the good old U.S. of A. Not and feeling rubber, that at all. Rubber arms is like, oh, so I guess um, you guys don't like Americans. And I remember, I remember that like it was yesterday. So this was a very interesting time because I, all of these dances were lessons to me. Mm-hmm. I learned a very important lesson in this dance, which was keep going. We had a 10 minute round. Mm-hmm. First three minutes were booze. The next three minutes was silence. Mm. The last four minutes was forwards. And it was one of those things where it was like, okay, this is where I'm learning how to push through mm. a booing crowd, like how to not get you know, intimidated by 4,000 people booing you, you know what I'm saying to you, and just play right through it and just wear them down, wear them down, wear them down until they're just like, yeah, man, yeah, go on, no, man. Mm -hmm. You know, 10 minutes. Um, Second round, the second round we kind of played in reverse. We ended the round the way we should have started it, and we started the round the way we should have ended it. So needless to say, um, they were settling in at this point, and um, this is when um, you know the sounds and the new tune that was starting to go on, mm-hmm. and um, so we dropped out. Classic dropped out first. We dropped out second. But like I said, I learned a very important lesson after that dance, um, as far as how to push through a crowd. Push through, mm-hmm. yeah, because you know at that time, you know. The Mighty Crown Dance was the last time I took a boo like that. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not going to lie to you. I had not the experience or the presence to even stand up to that. Now, yeah, at this particular point in the game, I know what to do. But then I, I didn't know anything. I was clueless. You turn it around. Right. So the next week, no, correction, next two days, because the UK Cup was Saturday. Mm-hmm. Jamaica, death before the sun was Easter Monday. So, okay, hold on, stop. Let me tell you what I remember about this. This was when you guys was, I think this was your first real bigger dance in Jamaica. And at, the death, and at the death before this honor, you chose number one. Yeah, mm. tell me about it. Now, mind you, I'm glad you set the stage. Mm-hmm. Glad you set the stage because now I'm going to put even more gravity on it. Mm-hmm. Winner of the dance goes to Athens, Greece with the Jamaican Olympic team. Yes, yes, yes. Because Puma, Puma was sponsoring the dance. You know, Jamaica Olympics, like, you know, the fly uniforms, all that good stuff. You know, um, the Puma people then were there. Um, okay, wonderful. Mm-hmm. So, you know, no foreign son was going to win this dance. <laughs> nope. Just to put that out there. We knew this going in. Mm-hmm. So it was on some... Me and Kirk were just like, yo, we're not going to win this dance. Let's give them a show. Mm. Songs we were cutting for this dance. The dance was Monday. The artist told us we were getting the dubs on Wednesday. Wow. Two days after the dance. Because at that point in time, the artists them treated World Clash like all horse race. Of so course. So artists bet on a specific song and whoever win and who but so all right. Anyway, so first round comes, we play it, and Chin makes the the, the speech. Don't oh, judge a new song, them to me, hear them play it loud. Mm-hmm. All right. So the lineup is Chupa, Panta, Mighty Crown, Mataran, and us. 
And I said it just like that for a reason. Mm -hmm. So here we are. First round. We're like, all right, we're just going to go guns out. Fifth element crew, a slap with the whole place, Rich Spice, Boss, Chuck Fender, get the bus back. Mm -hmm. All of them sound. So we roll out, we rinse. Mm -hmm. We're rinsing first round. Forward after forward after forward after forward after forward after mm. forward after forward after forward. Brother, that pure one crowd. That way, so when your boss that dance there, mm -hmm. you yo, you nobody can tell you you're not the king of the world at that point. Straight goods. Yes, bro. And um it was insane the amount of forwards we got, right? Trooper comes in, flop, first round. Every sound, every other sound coming, they played decent. Pantaguan good, right? Second round comes. We play. Now here's <laughs> <laughs> second round coming, right? And this is another lesson I learned. Second round came now. We ain't got no new tunes left. Mm. We just played all the new tunes we had in the first round. Mm -hmm. The new tune that we were supposed to get never came. Mm. So the first speech I make is big up all the artists them where we said no money forget song and then tell us that after the trash rag I get there. Who told me to say that? Bruh. I say that we go through the round mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lukewarm compared to the first round without question. Mm -hmm. But who told me to say that? <laughs> Trooper. Trooper comes in mm -hmm. and he uses that speech on tech. If them now work with the word called build, kill them. And he draws a little bit of a gear. Nothing too crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mighty Crown coming, them go on good. See, when Mighty Crown come in now, new tunes start fly. Mm -hmm. and we're sitting there on the side of the stage like, we were going to get this. We were going to get that. We were going to cut this. Between Mighty Crown and Mataran, the amount of new tune that dropped, because you know it's second round, there's no more introduction now. They're rolling out. Yeah. So needless to say, we drop out first. Mm -hmm. Chose um, first and gone first. And gone first. Um, here's the biggest lesson I learned after mm -hmm. that dance. Besides, don't blow your load in the first round. <laughs> 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 the biggest lesson I learned at that dance was. After the dance was done, Panta win. You know, we knew it was going to be Panta Troop or Mataran anyway. Mm -hmm. Panta wins. Um, and um, we're walking out of the dance, going back to the van to get to the hotel. And there's people outside. So they come over. Why is not Rasta youth? Big up on yourself. Bad sword. But you're what? I never owned a work on Fissy. Mm. That was it. Straight that up. last sentence hit me like a ton of bricks. That's when I realized. Mm. Mm. And then Mataran said shortly thereafter at the hotel, mm. the reason why Uno I go get to no ratings is because in a play some dance where Uno I everybody knows say Uno I go in and Uno still mm. go on back. And you still push through. Right, and you push mm. through. You know what I'm saying? And that was a learning experience in and of itself. Mm -hmm. At this point, I'm starting to grow more and more into the sound. And um, this time it was more you and Kirkusy that were on the road together. Yeah, because Redman came with us to UK Cup. He didn't come with us to um that before the summer. And, you know, he ended up getting like a, a new job out west. And, you know, so he had to phase back mm -hmm. on the sound system. A lot more. So it was essentially myself and Kirk at this particular time. When did the customs start to come into play? Uh -huh. That's a whole <laughs> seven years later. Okay. Um, we're we're not yeah. ready because because you're good with keeping the timeline so far. Yeah. We're not ready always, for that yet. Yeah, we're not reached that so yet. Mm -hmm. Um we're we're still like oh four, oh five mm -hmm. Antigua World Clash. Um, mm -hmm. you know. That was a dance, you know, we learned another lesson. I learned another lesson after that dance. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was one of those, the two poison darts were in the same clash, which was interesting in and of itself. Um, 
they made both of us play tune for tune and see who was going to get second place. <laughs> but um, that that one sounds Mater, so Mataran was Mataran was hosting. Mighty Crown ran away with the dance. Yeah, they played a round full of hip hop dubs and it was over. Mm -hmm. That was it. It was a wrap. You know, Fifty Cent, Lil John, everything, everything dropped. And um, yeah, so the two Poison Arts had to go tune for tune for second place. The crowd wanted to see it because. It's the first time both Poison Darks are in the same clash. So it was just like, hey, we want to see this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but Mighty Crown ran away with that dance. It was a landslide. It, it wasn't even close. Uh, Mataran was hosting. Um, mm -hmm. Pata dropped out early. Base out of sea, likewise. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think the Antigua Poison Art got second place. Yes. If I remember that dance good, you guys actually played better dubs than Poison Dart, but Poison mm -hmm. Dart was at home. So then, yes. plus, at the end of the day, yo, the home yeah. song is going to get this. If I yeah, remember it, that it, dance good. Yeah, it was home cooking. However, it was one of those, it was one of those instances, and this is a lesson that I learned at the time where you can lose a dance, but win, a, but win fans. Mm. You win respect. You know, even though you don't win the dance, you earn a certain amount of ratings and respect so much so mm -hmm. that when Poison Art kept their anniversary in Antigua that year in December, they brought us back. Okay. You know, yeah, it was Poison Art, Poison Art, and Jaro. Nice dance, by the way. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that was 05. So we reach 06 now. 06 was kind of a uneventful clash here. We were doing a lot of juggling at the time. Shata, Chris Rock. Juice mm -hmm. and all of them were on the mm -hmm. sound at this point. Mm -hmm. um, 07, 07. Whew, 2007. <laughs> we're going to fast forward all the way through 07 because, you know, we played Trooper one on one in 05. That dance was an instant classic, by the way. Um, okay. Yeah, we punched Trooper around and then Kirk wanted to go tune for tune with Trooper and he got back a little bit of lights, but. Needless to say, mm -hmm. let's fast forward. December of 07. Mm -hmm. Orlando, local warfare, Poison Dot, Mud Squad, Black Rose. Mm. I just came back from Jamaica with a bunch of songs on a little hard drive. Hmm. And for the first time in Sound Clash history, Bound to Kill a Dog was played on the war rhythm. I will never forget the experience yeah. of what Killer said. Lord Claude Poison Dart, I go give him Bob Marley rhythm for DJ upon a warm tuna. Who clacks it up? You expect me for DJ upon Bob Marley rhythm, I warm tuna. Then after he does the tune, mm -hmm. now I know it. But you know, so good. <laughs> they want it, but. <laughs> so so yeah. this was a dance where we realized Black Rose was the Orlando sound at the time well we knew it but we knew it after this yeah. because we ran away with the dance musically it wasn't even close mm -hmm. but when I tried to call them to win the dance oh, it was a Black Rose yep that that's song what it was. was. And that's what it was. Hmm. So, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. 2008 now. Let's fast forward straight to June. Mm -hmm. All right? Kirk already told you about the Poison Art Innocent Black Cat Dance in Fort Lauderdale. So, I won't bother getting into that. Kirk already mm -hmm. told that story. And I don't really have much to do with it except the fact that Innocent them planned for me. So we decided to throw them a curveball and have me not play the sound. Yeah. So and yeah. I played the dance by himself in front of his high school friends from Fort Lauderdale. And mm -hmm. he just destroyed the place. It was mm -hmm. it was a master class. So June 2008, here we are. Poison Art versus Innocent. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. This dance now is a dance where who's the best MC in America became the conversation. Is okay. 
or is it Nashim, or is it Ajax, or is it Jane? Ooh, Tarantula and Nashim are going to clash. This is it. Mm -hmm. So the answer's already tense. You know what I'm saying? Car. Miami showed up for Innocent, Fort Lauderdale showed up for Poison Dark, Tampa, everything. Dance one. The dance, you know, the Gully and Gaza thing is just starting to really kick off. Mm -hmm. um, Innocent is the Gully sound at the time. And Poison Dark was most certainly a cartel sound. 100%. Without question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Gully was leading the war at the time. So the Movado sang them a clap. Mm -hmm. They had them, the new ones. We did not. Mm -hmm. So when the dance started to boil down in the later, later rounds, that was quite evident. Innocent wins the dance. I am not happy mm -hmm. at all because at this point in time, I'm still in my ego. So, you know, I'm still in my ego and my competitive, you know, streak so i'm just like oh boy now i'm gonna go back on dhr and i'm gonna hear all these people talking about machine better than me and this that and third and blah 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 all of the things that didn't matter yeah in the grand scheme of life but at the time i was hot you know say, like we lost mm -hmm. you know this is in-state rivals like they got a bus off of us furthermore i didn't even want to play them in miami i wanted to play them in orlando okay you know what i'm saying so it was what it was though. But boom bang no. Shortly after this dance, I release no, let me let me let me say this correctly. Mm -hmm. The dancing songs were the jiggy craze was happening around mm -hmm. the same time. Um, you know, uh Nolinga, um, paper bagger and all those dances. Elephant, right. this is Elephant Man time. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, I hated most of those Jiggy songs. I just thought they were just saying, eh. right? I, I couldn't stand them at the time. I'm a hardcore selector, so I'm not really in other mm -hmm. Jiggy something there, right? A tight pants, you know, <laughs> all them, they were all them, they did their kind of song. Yeah. Not really into that, right? So, what ends up happening? I was in the studio with some regions of mine, and I'm like, yo, I'm going to show y'all how easy it is mm -hmm. to make a dancing song. And I'm going to make a dancing song about people who can't dance. Yes. Yes. So I make the song, right? Put it mm -hmm. in the little chipmunk voice just to be different. Because mm -hmm. at the time, at the time, DeMarco bust with auto tune and shit. So I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, let me take this to another level. Mm -hmm. Chipmunk. Jazzy T them hear the song, they come by the studio. Jazzy T them hear the song. He's like, yo, Moana sang your dog. I'm like, I'll play this. I'm looking at him like, you can't be serious. Yeah. He's like, no, man, Moana, play it. Moana, play the song. Moana, play the song. I give that man the song. Mm -hmm. I give Washi and Bobby Chin them the song. Willie Chin them the song. Tutu is a song, boss. Mm. Yes, bro. When I say boss, the song bus mm -hmm. to the point the song bus to the point where i am hearing it everywhere it got it, it got to we played a dance in um we played a dance in um in canada mm -hmm. i think it was ron nelson fully loaded at the time one of those dances we played and no no, it was it was the tag team dance clash with us and Mighty Crown versus on um, reaction. Black Crown right? Super Fresh, yep. Yes. And we went to we went to a club. We out in the east. White club. It was like in Pickering somewhere. Mm -hmm. right? said Pickering, wow. Yeah, it was like Pickering. It's like over there, you know, big up super super nothing, like over there in his territory, you know, wow. throw different. Of course. And um we're in the dance. Just there, not playing or not. We're just dead. You know, night before the clash, we are. All of a sudden, the freaking song comes on. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Mm -hmm. Come to find out, Specs is rinsing the tune into mm -hmm. the ground when he's juggling. I think he was on flow at the time, yeah? Yes. He was on at flow, that time, right? Yeah, at that time, it would be flow, yeah. Right. It was flow, eh? Right. So, <laughs> big up Specs, by the way. That's my G. 
Mm-hmm. The song bust, the song bust, the song bust. It got so bad to the point where, rest in peace, Joel Chin is in Jamaica trying to find Tarantula. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll find Tarantula. Mm-hmm. Bridges like, no, I'm on a Florida the youth there. Yeah. Joel Chin calls Waggy T. Yo, I'm trying to find Tarantula. Waggy T ends up calling Kirk. Kirk lets me know. Eventually, I get on the phone. By the time Joel Chin finds me, the, um, the timeline for the song to make strictly the best done pass already. Right. Okay. So he was like, I wanted to put the song on strictly the best. Got the song out there. I'm thinking to myself, oh, okay. Song bus. Mm-hmm. It got to the point where, you know, I'm, I'm doing dubs for it and stuff, but it, it, it was busing. Like it started to play in Spanish clubs, bro. That's how, that's how serious it got. Yeah, that's how serious it got to the point where some Panamanian artists did a, did a Spanish version of it. Bro. I, I can't remember the name of it on YouTube, mm-hmm. but it exists. They even made a video and everything. But long story short, the song bus. And it was like, okay. Now, mind you, Mataran is already out. Dirty Wine, mm-hmm. um, Sidon Panit, um, all of these songs. He's already hot. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he's like, yeah, man, the song, oh, they're man, like it's gone. Okay, right? Fast forward. Here we are, 2009, April. We get booked for a dance, War in the East, mm-hmm. tag team, USA versus Europe. Poison Art and Tech Nine versus Sentinel and Super Sonic. Hmm. I am still traumatized by this dance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna tell you why. I am still traumatized by this day. Only slightly. I, I, I've worked on my triggers. So. <laughs> yeah, I worked on my triggers, and um, you know, I, I, I um, needless to say, dance goes very well. Um, we perform very well, both of us. Rest in peace, Pretty Rick. Mm-hmm. We put on a show that night. We gave them a show. Yeah. Sentinel and Supersonic did what Sentinel and Supersonic do as European heavyweights. They played incredibly well. It was a, it was a classic dance. There was no neck. real weak fence. Everybody was just gunning on point, right? Neck and neck, tune for tune, last song, mm-hmm. tiebreaker. Mm-hmm. At this point, we have control of the crowd. I queue up the tool. I say, yo, Dennis Brown, exit. Mm. Let's seal this dance now, once and for all, done it. I'm going to park the crowd. Mm-hmm. I park the crowd. Yes, I did a squinching. I parted <laughs> yeah. the crowd. Mm-hmm. The crowd did what I asked, and they parted. I walked all the way to the door. I held my hand out toward the exit sign, mm-hmm. and I said, Sean, all I heard blaring through the friggin' speakers was <laughs> at this point, I am at least maybe a thousand feet from the stage. Mm-hmm. I can't get back there in time to be like, yo, what the fuck? That's all not, I know that, is that wasn't a plan. That was not the song. That was not the plan. Mm-hmm. The plan was Dennis Brown comes in. A sound boy made his way to the exit. That's done. It's over. None of those guys over there have Dennis Brown. This is an easy, easy win at this point. Mm-hmm. Because not only are you playing D Brown for a bunch of Dennis Brown fans in Europe, but you're playing a song that's completely pertinent to the speech I just made. Mm-hmm. Simple one, two, three. Instead, I hear skill <laughs> to this day. Mm-hmm. I know this to the <laughs> artist. To this day. In every single dance since then, I have outright refused to play that. <laughs> I don't even play the 45. They said not involved. That traumatized you, bro. Bro, I was so pissed. 
after the dance. You know, Elmar and Spider, yeah, man, you played great, man, blah, blah, blah. What happened? I was like, I don't even know what the hell happened. Mm -hmm. Kirk and Tech Nine have no explanation. Yeah, man, the song was queued up, and we pre we just, I guess we pressed play on the wrong side. I'm thinking to myself, why didn't you queue it up on both sides to mm -hmm. prevent any... Mm -hmm. Still traumatized. Right. Still. Still. That was one of those moments where I wish I could... And then what? <laughs> but it was just what it. But it's a it's another learning experience because if as you look, there's been a million learning experiences, and your learning experience has been on the battlefield with some big heavy Ross. Mm -hmm. So it's some Ross dance. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. Yeah. The learning experience then was yeah. Cue up the thing on both sides. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> nonetheless, we bust in Europe after the dance. Mm -hmm. Six months later, we're back. Okay. Min little mini tour. Um, 10 shows, 11 days. One of those shows happens to be Rhythm Clash. Mm. So it's, it's going to be a long interview, bro. We got a lot to talk about. Yeah, we, so, we got time. We got time. Yeah. So Rhythm Clash happens 2009. Great dance. Um, Civilized Z, City Lock, D Buzz, Shashamani, us. Black Cat was supposed to be there, but they didn't make it. So we're playing the dance. D-Buzz does well in the early rounds. We turn on, bro, we're running away. It's literally us and Civilized Z just miles ahead. City Lock starts to creep up in the later rounds. You know, they played some nice songs, got some forwards. Mm -hmm. Bobby Cardenas was the host. Mm -hmm. Big Up Major Hype, he was there too. Okay. Bobby. Um, Bobby Cardenas does something that I felt was unprecedented. He sends three sounds to Chum for Chum. Wow. This is another traumatizing moment. So <laughs> we have Poison Art. We have Civilized Z representing Belgium. We have City Lock representing Germany. Mm -hmm. So you have the Belgian crowd that's there. They all took a train to the dance. The dance is in Germany. It's in Cologne. So you have the German crowd there. And myself in the middle. If it was us versus either sound, my logic was, if it's us and Civilized Z, we're going to turn the Germans against them. Okay. Right? Because they're working with us too. If it's us against City Lock, we're going to turn the Belgians against them because they're working with us too. Mm -hmm. So that's my logic. I didn't expect to play both of them. <laughs> who do you turn? Who do I turn against who now? What? Where does this leave me? In the middle, which is the worst place to be mm. because we played first in the um, Dub for Dub. So we play our song. City Lock answers back our song. I'm sorry. Civilized Z answers back our song. Mm -hmm. City Lock just gets to do whatever they want. So they're just playing songs and just racking up points because there's no one there to counteract their tunes. Mm -hmm. They end up winning tune for tune and they take the trophy. Mm -hmm. However, according to the people, it was our dance. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which that'll factor in later on. Um, so that happens toward the end. But like I said, we bust in Europe now. Poison Art is officially bust in our Europe tarantula bus. We're nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're basically touring every year from that point. Right. Here we go now. 2010. Right. 2010, Froggy and myself decide to link up. And um, after the success of Kian Dance, mm -hmm. we decide to link up and we're going to do some productions. So at this point in time, this is where the mod from Mod Squad with two Ds. When I did it, it was with one. The mod from Mod Squad, Spider. Spider. Mm -hmm. Mad Spider Productions. As you see, mm -hmm. that's the logo. Mm -hmm. Right? So we build our first, I build the rhythm. First rhythm, basic instinct. Right? Mm -hmm. We're working with Delhi Ranks at the time. Big up Delhi. Delhi had just relocated from Jamaica, you know, and he's mm -hmm. up here and where they are work. And he's giving us tutelage and guidance on, you know, how to, you know, produce a juggling. I had no idea how this was going to work. <laughs> you know, Froggy had the links with certain, uh, certain artists where I work with a team. And he did that side of it. And I took care of the music. I built the rhythms. 
the songs came in. I did the mixing, you know what I'm saying? All of that good stuff. And Froggy had the links with the select of them, you know, radio stations, you know, Weasel, mm -hmm. Smurf, Liquid, you know, Ice, et cetera, et cetera, so on, so forth, right? So, you know, Colin Hines, Kirk Riley, you know the works. The top, top radio DJs. All of them. Because remember, they're giving us selector strength because the whole are we are selector. So we're voicing. You know, we get Delhi Ranks, we get Mega Banta, we get Lexus, we get, um, who else did we get? We got Egyptian, mm -hmm. um, we got Wing Wonder, we got, and we got a Bojo. Hmm. You know, we got Delhi Ranks, he was the one who lined up all of that because him and Bojo were very close at the time. Yep. And, you know, they still are to my knowledge. So, needless to say, the first rhythm we put it out, summer of 2010, um, the rhythm was, especially for our first production, it was a success. It was, it did well. Mm -hmm. um, it was all over every radio station. It was literally playing every hour on the hour, 24 seven, um, to the point where people thought we spent big money, but we didn't, you know, it was a select of strength and on top strength. of that, and we had sung that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we get into a little tiff with VP over the Egyptian song. They ended up wanting to take down the whole rhythm. Because, you know, VP Egyptian, they had the, and Julio was out of here at that point in time. So they didn't want anything else associated with Egyptian to come in conflict with that. So okay. we had to, we had to take that down. So it's not up there on the iTunes. Um, but you know, sound men or sound men still have it. Needless mm -hmm. to say. So we're at a space where, you know, the budget comes out and we do well. Now I'm on tour in Europe. Boom, get the link. Joel Chin mm -hmm. wants to put um, the Bujo on Strictly the Best. That was a no big look. No, I'm going work, you know, country kind of insurance, you know. Mm -hmm. We don't need to you know, so, you know country kind of insurance. That's all he said. Man, ain't saying nothing else. Country kind of insurance. You know, that was it. <laughs> so he was like, no, nah, that can't happen. Mm -hmm. So, nonetheless, we compiled the medley of the song that Froggy and Deli did together and my song, Ring Me Pine Fing Bami at the Kia Tech Guitar. And mm -hmm. to put it together as a girl's medley, that ended up making it all strictly the best 43. At mm -hmm. this point, you couldn't tell me nothing. <laughs> you couldn't yeah, tell God. me, say, man, I'm a producer. You couldn't tell me, say, man, I'm a hit. You couldn't tell me nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from that point on now, you know, production. Now, mind you, I never wanted to be an artist at no yeah. point in time. It was Deli Ranks, Froggy, and Wing Wonder. Those three people, big them up, who were like, yo, we know you want to be Dave Kelly. We know you want to be the brains behind the whole operation, but you have to go put out some song in a damn car, you know, the people that might be here, you'll find something. Because this was after the dancing song and all these stuff here. This was after Kian dance, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it was just like, yeah, you know. You can't be there about the chip monkeys, you are about the people of the area, like, boom, 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 right? So, put out the song, the song does well, right? So, here we are now, later 2010. Um, I'm working on the next rhythm. Uh, the next rhythm ended up being a rhythm called Island Breeze. We yes. released it in the uh, spring of 2011. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we were voicing, we were voicing for that rhythm and Delhi's production, which was Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Right. I voiced a song called Takeover mm -hmm. on that rhythm. And that ends up doing well also. And Delhi gets a Mujo Fati five on the rhythm of Slack for the whole place. Hmm. And um, you know, they do it did its thing. So now at this point, it's like, okay, this artist thing is starting to bubble up now. So we're working on the island breeze, and I'll never forget it was Delhi. You know, and we in one that they down there with Bojo. And we in one that's about to voice is 45 on the rhythm. Bojo hears the rhythm. Yo, you don't say I want all my rhythm them down to know. Oh, yeah, well, old Palmer singer. Oh, yeah, I do. So Bojo ends up voicing on the rhythm. Mm -hmm. He voices that song and he voices his verse on Ja Army around this, like at the same, you know, session, mm -hmm. which were the last 45s that he would voice before he went in, mm -hmm. you know, to do his time or whatever. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, second rhythm we put out Island Breeze. This is March of 2011. Um, and around the same time, Delhi puts out Delhi puts out what is my favorite production of his. Okay. Which is our rhythm, which is our rhythm called the Sweet Con. Yes. Yeah. I did a song on it called Long Time and No. That rhythm, it's literally my favorite pure music production. Mm -hmm. Um, every song on the rhythm, but you know, I was actually singing on that. You know, I just wanted to showcase a different side of my um, you know, my skill set, so to speak. So, you know, both of those rhythms do, you know, fairly well. Island Breeze, we get the Bojo 45, it does its thing. We get Sizzler. Now you really can't tell me, Semi, I'm a producer. I'm a Bojo, I'm a Sizzler, I'm a rhythm. I'm a guy, tell me no. Only thing left now is a killer and you're completely gone through the door. Precisely. So, right, we get a Bojo, we get a Sizzler. And on the old school level, we got a general degree. You know, okay. man just surfaced out of nowhere. I was like, yo, more advice when I read it. I'm like, I was like, Froggy, hot please. Man said, yo, we're not even know. So anyway, so the rhythm does its thug thizzle, right? And we do its thing. And I remember putting, I overproduced that rhythm. I had so many different sounds going into it at the time. Mm -hmm. I soloed a bunch of sounds that I was going to remove mm -hmm. from the Island Breeze rhythm. That it just didn't belong. It was just too much. Mm -hmm. There was no space for vocals. And the sounds that I ended up taking out of the Island Breeze rhythm ended up becoming the hot water rhythm, which we'll get to. That was like a year later. That's so, crazy. right. So now we're here, we are, we're 2011. And um, October of 2011, I'm on tour in Europe. The final date of the tour is a clash. Mm -hmm. Rhythm Magazine decides to put on a clash because they weren't doing Rhythm Clash that year. Okay. They put on a clash where the 2010 Rhythm Clash champion will play against the People's Champion of 2009. Mm. Thus, Heavy Hammer versus Poison Dart, one-on-one. -on -one. This is my last date of the tour. It's in U-Club, Wuppertal, Germany. This is October... I don't know, 24th, something like that. It's mm -hmm. quite frankly, it's almost 11 years to the day, right? Yeah, yeah it's crazy enough. And so, play the dance now. Landslide. Now, this is me by myself, clashing, right? It's tough now. Yeah, it's me alone because I'm on the tour by myself. This is me alone. This is the first time I'm clashing alone on the sound. Big clash because Heavy Hammer is. This is the hottest sound in Europe at the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They just won the rhythm track. They're a force at this point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So play them in Germany. And it was just one of those nights when everything just worked. Landslide. Rafa will tell you to this day, that's the worst beat me ever back in a dance. Yeah. And, um, you know, got a big win. I voiced two customs. Mm -hmm in that dance um they were the first two songs i played in the first round i actually beatboxed the style of rhythm <laughs> I, I beatboxed the style of rhythm for the customs and um the second one mm -hmm. the first one i sung over that old half by tune um if i had a hammer so i, I flipped it you know heavy hammer blah blah, blah. yes yes um so the second one i did it in a nikobima style because at the time I was listening to Beer Stir Mars up, play for the game, we love his honor, like all of that shit. So Nicodemus style now, and I big up all of the sounds in Europe. Mm -hmm. And then Heavy Hammer, you know, whoever I look at Sony, Heavy Hammer, you know, what's up, their mother, blah, blah, blah. Big forward. Big, big forward, right? Mm -hmm. Started off the dance. I get home now. This is November 2011. I get a call. Panza. Super sign. Mm -hmm. gives me a link. He says, hey, blue that. You know? Like, hey, so you played a custom versus W Hammer and, you know, I wanted something like that for this clash you have coming up. I was like, what clash is this? Mm -hmm. He said, Global Clash in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So he gave me the lineup and he wanted me to cut it on the Super C Bad Boy rhythm. 
Mm. So the way I cut the song was the same way I cut um do you be um the, the one I did for for poison. I didn't the Nicodemus I, style. Nicodemus style. Mm -hmm. I didn't put my name in the custom. Okay. I just I just voiced it to sing up all of the sounds. Supersonic plays the dub. The forward was mm -hmm. insane. It was mm -hmm. probably the biggest forward for the night. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew who it was at yeah. the time. It was like, is this Junior Demos? Junior Demos walks into the desk. People like, yo, the truth must the test. He's like, which what you, truth? Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying to you? Eventually it gets around, gets around, and then people find out that it's me. And at that point in time, December of 2011 is when the custom team kick off. That was it. Because listen, I remember at one point you had like a stranglehold on freaking Clash when it came to the custom boss. It was freaking ridiculous. If you go to a Clash and you don't hear a Trilantula play, you're not in a Clash, bro. Right. That It started at that point. Right there was when it really started. That was it. It was... It was the beginning of the whole tidal wave. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we had released our third rhythm, which was called the Not Tonight. I took mm -hmm. the Keaton text tonight and flipped it mm -hmm. in my own little way. That was the Not Tonight. Um, yeah. We got a cool song on that rhythm from, um, from Carlton Coffee, formerly of Inner Circle. Okay. Um, yeah, it was just one of those things that happened out of the blue. It was crazy. Uh, you know, he heard about, you know, some of the work we did. And, you know, we made that happen. Nice production. I, it wasn't too many songs. Like, I overloaded Island Breeze and Basic Instinct, like 15, 16 songs on those rings. On Not Tonight, it was like a six-pack. Got you. Know? Keep it, keep it yeah. simple and keep it, keep it simple. Easy. Right. Um, fast forward now. February of 2012, Matt Spider Productions releases their fourth rhythm. Which happens to be, if I had to pick a favorite, this is definitely it. The hot water. Yes. Um, this is when I soloed all the signs that I put in the island breeze and took them out, and it became that brilliant. I'm in the mic, I'm in the booth with the teapot, pouring the water into the cup in front of the microphone, and that's how the yeah. all of that, right? Hot water. So, you know, we got whole bunch of artists on this rhythm. It, it, it's easily my favorite if I had to pick one. Um, you know, Wayne Wonder, Sizzler, we got Erup, um, Kip Rich, Froggy, Delhi, Maka Diamond, um, Ling Dog. I can't even remember everybody that was on the rhythm, but it was so much contribution. And by far, it was my favorite production, my favorite rhythm. It just sounded completely different from everything else that was mm -hmm. taking place at the time. And, um, you know, the rhythm one, do it thing. And, um, you know, at this point in time, all of our productions are playing all over every radio station in Jamaica. It was impossible to be in Jamaica and turn on the radio and not hear one of our rhythms play at least once every hour. And it wasn't just one station. It was all of them. It was Zip. It was Irie. You know what I'm saying? Like, all of them. So... We fast forward now. At this point, it's customs, it's production, and it's sound. All of this is going on, mind you. At the Simulta same time. Simultaneously, all of this is happening. All of this is happening, same time, mm -hmm. right? Boom, bang, no. We fast forward. World Clash 2012 happened in New York City. Um, I voiced the Frank Sinatra custom, New York, New York. Um, <laughs> This is Radigan and a few other sounds. It, it came off good. It got a nice forward. Mm -hmm. um, at this point in time, everybody's like, yeah, Tarantula, you know, you're going to hear some customs. All right, cool. We're good. So just like you said, it was the stranglehold was Crazy. getting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and like every dance, every dance customs were happening. Um, so fast forward. We'll get to July of 2012. Big clash. Mm -hmm. July 7th. 2012, yeah, 10 years ago, July. Poison Dart versus King Abbey's. Okay. In Brooklyn. This is where, now, is this now where you're the person that you looked up to 
which was face, is now who you got to go war with right now? No. No. And I'm going to tell you why. Mm -hmm. Because this point in time was when Kingpin and A1 mm -hmm. and Sugidan were just on the sound for maybe a year. Mm -hmm. Maybe a year and a half. Like somewhere around there. Because they just did Global Clash in December. And they won. Mm -hmm. You know? So it was a nice, you know, presence or whatever. But yeah, this is, they were just on the sound doing their thing. Um, if you remember correctly, for a very short period of time, um, starting in October 2011, after the heavy hammer clash, Babyface had joined Poison Art for a very short spell. Um, what? Mm -hmm. How long was I'm he up to? Yeah, a couple months, maybe. Played a few know. dates. I'm surprised Kirk didn't tell you this. Did Kirk, you see the thing? I'm sure he mentioned it. We sat down like about almost three years, two years ago. So mm -hmm. might have, might not. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. Nonetheless, yeah, he was on the sign for, you know, a couple of months. You just to say, um, you know, big up Lion Face, anywhere he had as teach. Um, so he wasn't on IDs at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we play and then um, that dance now. Ooh. That dance was one of those nights where it's one. It's like basketball. It's one of those nights where every shot you put up goes in. Mm. It's just one of those nights where you can't miss. Everything just works. Like we play the first round, no talking. Kirk is selected, masterclass. He plays flawlessly. Like everything was just the stars lined up. I don't know what it was. It was just perfect mm -hmm. and. We were like, yo, we got the songs to play with this sound. They don't really have much that we ain't got. Let's gun this out. Mm. So we're going to go there. We're going to play our songs. Because we got our stuff. They have their stuff. We're going to gun this out. So first round, no talking. Nice round. Second round, Swoogie comes in. And this is where dances get interesting. And I, I learned this at this dance. Mm -hmm. I learned that it reminds me of another dance that I forgot about, but I'll get back to that. I learned that you have different kinds of dances. You have, you have dub box dances, you have selection dances, and you have MC dances. You understand. You know? mm -hmm. And you don't know what kind of dance it's going to be until you get there in the venue and you see what the crowd is responding to. Mm -hmm. We go into this dance. I'm under the impression this is going to be a selection dance. Because I'm looking at it and I'm saying, Kirk is over here. Those guys are over there. They haven't really finished learning the box yet. We have the more experienced selector with our dub box. This is going to be a selection dance and we're going to out-select them. Mm -hmm. When Swoogie takes the microphone in the second round and he gets a couple nice forwards, it instantly changed to an MC dance. Okay. So it was like, okay, now I got to put up my numbers. And it, like I said, it was one of those nights where because you never know in a clash. You never know when your, your tactics are going to work. It was one of those nights when everything worked. Hmm. You could not miss. It was, it was insane. Like, it, it was a beat down. And that's no remember, this is any of them. This is in Brooklyn, too, you know, this Boston. Is in Brooklyn. The people then were on Addy's side of the dance when we got in. And by the time we were done, they were on our side, like in the middle towards our side of the venue. It was a beat down. When I say a beat down, I mean, a, we walked out of the dance before tune for tune. I was taking pictures in the crowd with people on the way out. While Addie's them is talking about, oh, they're my run, tune for tune. We're walking out. There's a few people, a good amount of people walking out of the dance behind us. Mm. As we're leaving, like, yo, this is over. It's a wrap. Done for. Mm -hmm. Big up, Drew, HIM, mm -hmm. long time hecklers. I've known that man since 1997. That's the first time we ever had an argument. Kind of so on dead night, people like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just was what it was. Yeah. And like I was saying, it turned out to be an MC dance where I had to, you know, there's certain clashes that test different elements of your sound. Mm -hmm. That dance was an MC dance. Because if I and remember good, Spooky was more like almost like a, 
a bad man type of MC at that time there. You know what I mean? Absolutely. There was one, there was one thing you you, do, you couldn't tell Spooky them time. There was suck him woman them time. Or else yeah, 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 yeah. Fighting. That was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, that's Spooky persona. Big up Spooky and them. And that's mm -hmm. his persona. And mm -hmm. it just is what it is. It's authentic. You know, it's real. It's him. You know what I mean? So, you know, you have to take a different approach with that. You know, you can, you can, you can match the aggression, exceed the aggression, or you can circumvent it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of did a little bit of, you know, both. And eventually it became killable on the microphone. And mm -hmm. at that point it was like, okay, I'm going to get him. And so said, so done. Like I said, it was just one of those nights when everything just worked. Kirk was selecting perfect. The crowd was reacting to what we were doing. The speeches were flowing. They were connecting. It, it just worked. Bro. It just worked. And um, that was, yeah, that was a fun time. Yeah. That was a fun time. Um, that At that point, that's when it was like, okay, like if anybody didn't know before, it was like, yeah, Spider's really that deal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it was the polar opposite of, you know, the mighty crown dance 11 years ago. There was none of that on social media. Yo, get rid of, no, it was like, no, man, I yeah, it's spider sound. It's him. You know what I'm saying? And it, it just, like I said, it was Real just deal. one of those nights. It was one of those nights. And, um, you know, it makes me think about another dance that was a total selection dance. This was in 2008. I started it over because I forgot. There's so many clashes. I forget. Some. Yeah, there's there's a Sometimes. lot. Yeah, so much stuff. <laughs> um, 2008. It was Houston, Texas. It was a vintage rumble. So all sound, all songs, 2000 and before. Mm -hmm. Vintage rumble tag team, Poison Dart and Downbeat versus Mighty Crown and Addies. Yes, that was a selection dance. That mm -hmm. now, as an MC, when you're in a selection dance. You just make a quick speech and you get out of the way. Mm -hmm. That's not the dance for you to be saying too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The crowd is there for your selection. And bro, Kirk and Tony Swoop. Mm -hmm. My God. That was a that was a night. Needless to say, we won that trophy. We took those trophies home. You know, Chin wasn't happy, but he had to live with it. Um, but wasn't there even one point in your career where you guys were basically it was Mighty Krong and Poison Dart sparring for like a hot minute. Yeah, yeah, we were, we were, you know, we were sparring for a good little second. Because remember, we did that tag team clash in Canada. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, you know, we did. Um, we were sparring for a little bit. Um, when I was going to Japan, you know, I was doing like you know some of their dances over there, like Sound Fest and things of that nature. So, you know, big up Mighty Krong. You know, I'm a virgin. Those are my G's for sure. Um, so yeah, it was. Um, but yeah, 2012, that is what a night. That's all I got to say. That was a night. Um, when that cartel dropped, yeah, I'm me now I'm out, and I'm right there in Kilimanjaro. Oh my God. That yes. was special. But um, yeah, that was, like I said, it was one of those nights when everything just worked. Mm -hmm. um, I skipped over another clash. See, the clashes are starting to come back to me now. Mm -hmm. It was... It was us and Mighty Crown in Antigua one on one. It was 2010. It was April. Okay. Um, yeah. They ended up winning that dance in tune for tune, but that dance was pretty hardcore when we played the um to Jason. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Oh. Cool, cool. But so, remember at this time here, when it came when it came to crazy, crazy areas. Antigua was one of those places. Their energy out there was next. To now, nah, man, Antigua war grown, man. What? Yeah, man, Antigua war grown. Long time, long, 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 long mm -hmm. time since since the days of Addis Clash and Exorcist over there. War mm -hmm. grown, man. Stonewall, all of that. And to this day, it's still a war grown. We got okay. war daply. It's war daply over there. Mm. So, so yeah. So the, see, I'm hearkening back. Like I said, it's stream of consciousness. So 2012 we're at and, um, you know, the Addis dance happens and, um, you know, we're gearing up for the next rhythm. Mm -hmm. Um, this rhythm was called GSUM. This is where your so, sound man, this is where your sound man gets into play at this point here. 
Right. The rhythm itself was called mm-hmm. GSUM. The mm-hmm. title song was GSUM, <laughs> which we know what GSUM is. Yes. Um, big up Striker, because we literally crafted the song for Striker, Striker DJ the song, and it, 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 it clapped. It definitely clapped. And, um, you know, the rhythm did its stuff fizzle. And later on that year, what ended up happening in 2012 was Big Up Pee Wee from Pretty Pussy. You know, that's, that's my bona fide virgin. Um, he introduced me to, he introduced me to a virgin by the name of Danny Neville. Mm-hmm. Who is like, Danny Neville is, I, like, I'm trying to think of a big hip hop DJ. I guess you could say like, or big radio DJ, sorry. Like the Bobby Condors or the Funkmaster Flex Got of you. Dubai. Mm-hmm. of dubai right and um you know we hit it off nice relationship good vibes and you know he offers to bring me out there to dubai to play. so after my european tour in 2012 i jump on a plane six hour flight to dubai hmm. and um first time middle east arab world different city right this is october mm-hmm. quick five day run Right. Um, now, remember, I was telling you about when I was playing my local venues and, you know, bringing that dance or energy to like the white crowds and the pop yeah. crowds and the mixed audiences and mm-hmm. basically doing dance or emceeing style. But in English, mm-hmm. this is where all of that comes into play, because now I'm in the Middle East. It's a mixed audience. You have, you know, you have your Emiratis, you have your Arabs, you have your Africans, and then you have your British expats and they're all in one place listening to a mixture of genres of music and I'm emceeing in English and I'm bringing them that energy, which they're not exactly used to at the time. Okay. And, um, yeah. And it, it worked very well, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, get our nicicle, nicicle bus over there. So, um, and I fall in love with Dubai. I'm like, this place is amazing. Hmm. So two months later, I go back. <laughs> Now, mind you, when I go back now, this is December, I didn't spend five days. Mm -hmm. I spent six weeks. Wow. We decide, Danny Neville and I decide at this particular point in time, we are going to do a Middle Eastern version of Major Lazer. Arab Selector. Mm-hmm. Well, he's Lebanese, but Arab selector, Jamaican MC, right? And we were going to call the project Dubnetics, right? Okay. Dance hall, hip hop, EDM mm-hmm. mashup. It's like a hybrid of, you know, like a everything in a pot. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're working on the songs, we're doing the thing, right? We are riding four wheelers and doom buggies in the desert. Danny, Danny knows everybody. Cause like I said, he's the number one radio jock over there. So when the artists them come, you know, boom, boom, bang, he has the links, good relationships. So we there, we out there, Chris Brown, boom, boom, bang, right? So, and like, yo, what do you think about doing a radio record? Cause he's like, yeah, man, bang, bang, bang. Great idea. All right, cool. Come to the studio. All right, we'll be here tomorrow. All right, cool. So we're like, oh shoot. So boom, I'm bang on it, putting together a rhythm, you know, sing the chorus, I'm ready. Chris Brown, Dubnetics, we about to do something sick, take over the world, rich. Next day comes, Chris Brown ends up, you know, at a yacht party with one of the shakes, you know what I'm mm-hmm. already. So he doesn't make it to the studio and give us to sing, right? Next day after that, Chris Ron leaves for Nigeria. Next day after that, enter Jack York. Jack York comes by the studio. Mm-hmm. Jack York hears me playing the rhythm. I'm just now doing background vocals on the rhythm. Jack York said, I was like, yo, it was for, you know, so and so. So, no, sir, I might sound this. It's the please. I know I might sound this. Jack York does the song. It takes me about 
between he and I, we wrote the verses in like 30 minutes, mm -hmm. record the song, wine slow, mm. incredible piece of show, the song, mm -hmm. but the song, but the song, but the song, but right mm -hmm. now we're keeping this with the Dubnetics project. Later on, we find out that, um, later on, we find out that, you know, he's still intertwined with, you know, he has a situation with VP. So releasing music, opportune, blase, blase. So mm -hmm. needless to say, the song hasn't come out, right? I do a remix. <laughs> You're going to like this one. I do a remix of a song called Finally Free. Yeah. With a Canadian artist by the name of, wait for this, Carl Wolf. Ah, yes, bro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was supposed to be for a movie soundtrack, but the movie ended up not coming out. So we were going to keep it for the Dumb Edits project. Mm -hmm. um, then he ended up putting it on YouTube. But needless to say, it was a tough piece of tune, um, Carl Wolf and I. And we began our working relationship at that point. You know, as you know, Carl Wolf is Lebanese, and yeah. him and Dad grew up together. Yes, blase, blase. So, question: you know, Now, was at yeah, this point, are you still are you still playing Poisoner at this time here right now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hold we'll, on, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. Okay, we'll get no that. problem. We'll get, to, right. we'll get to that part. So, yeah, I'm still playing the sound. I'm still voicing customs, mm -hmm. and I'm doing Mad Spider Productions, and now I've taken on this project as well. So all of this is going on. Yes. See him time. Needless to say, I don't have much of a social life at this point. At all. So, right. So, um, so we do the song, you know, everything, Chris, come back from Dubai, you know, get ready to gear up for the sixth Mad Spider rhythm, which was a rhythm called Mixed Flavor. Mm -hmm. This rhythm, interestingly enough, we decided to do all combinations. Mm. Every song on the rhythm was a combination. And it was kind of like single DJ, like uh, outlandish. Like one song was Delhi Ranks and Wayne and Rain Seville. Um, another one was Wayne Wonder and Liquid. Mm -hmm. Another one was Froggy, now Battle General. Froggy and Patex. And I did a combination with Bling Dog. Six pack, nothing crazy. Roll it out. Mm -hmm. Um Fast forward now, 2013 was an interesting year. March of 2013, mm -hmm. Sound Clash, all the manner of Brooklyn, March Madness, mm -hmm. yes, Poison yes. Dart, yes. mm -hmm. Blunt Posse, Earth Ruler, right? Foregone conclusion, let's get this out of the way. Blunt Posse wins the dance, right? This okay. is a dub box. This is a dub box dance. Remember, I was telling you, you have dub box dances selection, and this is a dub box dance. Got you. Blood Posse started dumping out those new songs, mm -hmm. the chronics, them on all these things. Rap. They ran away with all of the rounds. Um, we were a distant second, mm -hmm. and Earth Ruler was a absolutely positively flatline dead last. Um, you know, I tried to turn it into an MC dance. It didn't work. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was getting the forwards for the speeches, but it was really a dub box dance. That's what the people I'm responding to. Mm -hmm. And um, that was it. Something hit me while I was on the stage. Mm -hmm. It was a moment in the dance. It was somewhere, I think it was either the second round or the third round, where I'm on stage and I'm going through the motions of playing. Mm -hmm. And I take a moment and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing up here? Yeah. I remember asking myself that question while on stage. And it was like, okay, this might be it. Because it was a situation where I was no longer, I was phasing myself out interest-wise. Mm -hmm. I was phasing myself out of playing the sound in a clash, you know, sense. Mm -hmm. And I was getting more and more into the artist producer kind of situation. So it was like, I became less interested in playing the sound clashing. Now, part of that was, I wouldn't even say the money. 
it was more just a new set of challenges, if that makes any sense. Do you understand but, what I'm saying? But remember, you have four things going on at this time, four high level things happening at the same time. So something has had to, to give. give. Mm -hmm. Right. And it became, I started to look at Clash in the sense like, I just got to a point where it's a point of, in my opinion, no return in the sense that the people who rate you are always going to rate you. And the people who don't rate you, they never will. Yeah. So at this point, it's just homeostasis. You're just like maintaining your position. You're not going up. You're not falling down. You're just mm -hmm. there. And it started to become redundant to me. And once I realized, okay, I'm not a hundred percent into this. I'm like, yo, for the little bit of people that have come to see me, if I can't give them my hundred percent, it don't make no sense. I pay with their money. Yeah. So I'm going to stop. Hmm. And that clash was my absolute last clash. That was my last time on a clash stage. That, uh, so what did, when you spoke to Kirkusy and you told him, say, okay, this is what I want to do. What did he say at that time there? It wasn't like a conversation. It was, he saw what was going on. So as the phasing out was taking place, it was like, he understood the progression, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it was just a thing where it was just like, yo, um, I don't even really want to do this like that. You know what I'm saying? And he kept it pushing. You know what I'm saying? He understood. Mind you, I'm playing juggling dances and stuff like that. I'm touring still, right? I'm touring. I, I, um, I ended up going to Japan that year, um, 2013. And I went to Europe that year. Now here's where things get interesting <laughs> because we're going to fast forward to August, right? August of 2013, there's a clash happening in Brooklyn in the yard of CPAC. It was Tech Nine versus Innocent one-on-one -on -one clash. Tech Nine is playing on Y2K Venom song. Mm -hmm. Innocent is playing on Prism, Pretty Pussy song, The Yellow Bird. And Pee Wee had been linking me for a good amount of time. Like, yo, I need a custom an anthem for the sound. Mm -hmm. I need an anthem for the sound. You know, just highlighting the sound. And I was like, you know what? I got something in mind. This is when I'm starting to play with Pro Tools, automation, different thing. I'm messing around with all different kinds of, because these are ideas I planned on using in customs, you know, having voices going left and right. Mm -hmm. So I take all of those ideas and I combine them together on the general rhythm. Um, cause that's the rhythm he had his garden soaked up on. So he wanted to mix that in afterwards. And I created what is now known as the yellow bird tuna. Mm. I send Pee Wee the dub the night before, sorry, the day before the dance. Mm -hmm. I voiced the dub in the bedroom of the apartment that I was staying in in Holland. Crazy. And I had to jump on the train because I had to play a dance in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. My voice was hoarse at the time. That's why I put the walkie-talkie effect on my voice because I couldn't DJ it straight, mm -hmm. which ended up working out correctly anyway. I had to mix the dub on the train from Enskede to Amsterdam. It was a two hour ride, which gave me enough time to put a mix on it. Big up the Dutch trains into city because they have free Wi-Fi. Wow. So uh, I was able to set the dub from the train, mm -hmm. mixed it in headphones, laptop, mobile studio, all that good stuff. And he, he hears the dub on the phone. He's like, yo, it's out. He plays the dub early in the sound check. He's like, it was sound good. Later on in that dance is where history was made. Mm -hmm. Now she locks off tech nine, right? Locks off tech nine on Venom sound. I mm -hmm. says, you know what? Pee wee, more I play that song, more I play that dub. In front, the whole crowd is there, like about a good 800, 900,000 people. Mm -hmm. 
the dance is streaming live, right? So people around the world are watching. Now she drops the dub, Yellow Bird tune. Mm. You know what I'm saying? First, it talk that. You hear the tweet as everybody's like, oh shit. Mm -hmm. And you hear my whistle and it talk come through the uh, no, I turn the mid range turn on, and then the mids come on in the rhythm. Everybody's like, oh shit. Mid so clean in our face. <laughs> We're gonna test each side before we drop the bass. Move it mm -hmm. to the left, and then the rhythm goes to the boxes on the left. Right. Everybody's like, oh shit. No push it to the right, and the rhythm moves again. Mm -hmm. And before you can hear the forward building. No have advice on the right, our rhythm on the left. Everybody's like, oh shit. No move it back to the center. What I sound so sweet, team, and then it goes, how this I saw that you know said views are done the place. No time for test out the BS. No make your roll. Yo, when the bass line drop. Yo, feel place. Boss. Like, bro, it was like I think it was probably one of the biggest forwards of the night. Bread mm -hmm. out. It was history at that point. You listen to listen to what you did, though, bro. Listen to how you constructed. Yeah. I I can't even imagine how you <laughs> constructed the song and then actually had to go back and mix it to the way how you DJ it. That is mind blowing, all in itself. Yeah, man, it was an idea that I was toying around with, you know, like you know, frequencies and things like mm -hmm. that. Because remember, I learned all of these things engineering from mixing all of the Mad Spider productions. Like if you listen to how all of the mix downs are done on all the songs, mm -hmm. I'm doing all of that. So I'm growing as an engineer as well as a producer. So all of those things and, you know, messing around with customs, doing all kinds of vocal effects, it, it all came together. It was a culmination. And um, that dub made history. In many ways, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain in a second. Mm -hmm. Um two weeks after that though. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks after that, I voiced another dub. Mm -hmm. I voiced two for this clash coming up. King Adi's first is big size. Mm. I voice a dub on the war with him mm. as a direct counteraction to base Odyssey's Bojo Ante. Bro, go see all be excited, see all the islands. I don't know who the hell told me to say that, mm -hmm. but I said it. <laughs> and there was a not between the selectors. Mm -hmm. We're all still cool, but there was a between courtesy and owners, like between owners. Mm -hmm. Without even calling, there was a level of acrimony. Mm. The two bosses of the two sounds over the whole squidgy situation is Kurt already mentioned in his interview. I won't even belabor all of that. Rest in squidgy, that's my brother for life, right? Now, all of that, well, not all of it, but a good portion of that acrimony went into the dub. <laughs> it went into the dub. The dub was done with a certain level of hostility, a certain level of of disrespect it was intended right. right right it was intended disrespect so when when all of that takes place now mind you the dub plays in tampa at the clash on poison arts machine by the way could have clashed mm. well, yo when the place mush up the place mush up the place mush up the place mush up Another historical, at this point, the custom thing was, it was like pinnacle at this point. Mm -hmm. It was, it was insane. Mm -hmm. The hype around the customs. It was just, it was undeniable who mm -hmm. the custom quote unquote king was. But right. Hey, let me tell you the trick with those customs. The trick with them were none of these customs were actual songs. These were right. actual custom made for this night you have no clue what this guy is gonna say what it's exactly. gonna say but it's just so crazy that this is what we want to hear and that's that's the way i wanted to do it i didn't want it to be like how you know an artist will take a song that already exists mm -hmm. and um you know they'll change up a couple of words so to speak and you know and just make it work that way i wanted it to be a situation where you know it's something you're hearing for the first and probably last time because I'm not going to DJ those lyrics again. 
You understand what I'm saying? I wanted it to come off like how those freestyles used to come off on the hip hop mixtapes. So it's like, it's a verse the rapper spits and you're never going to hear that verse again on any of his albums. You got to go back and listen to that freestyle. You know what I mean? And all of that came from battle rap, essentially. I took elements of battle rap, punchlines, name flips, themes, and, and put those into sound clash to create those customs. That makes so, sense. Right. So that dub makes its own fair share of history, right? Now, mind you, we fast forward, wait, right? I'm back in Dubai, mind you. And we're working on the Dubnetics project. I get a Skype call that at the time I did not realize would change my life. Hmm. I answered the call. It was Walshie Fire. Walshie is in the studio with Diplo, with Major Laser. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, I told you we were just working on Dubnetics, which was supposed to be a Middle Eastern version of what? Major Laser. Mm hmm. While she's on Skype with Diplo, Diplo's in the back on the camera. While she's like, yo, we want the Yellowbird tune-up, though, Clay. We have an idea for it mm -hmm. to make a song. We want you to do the dub for us. Mm -hmm. At this point, everybody's asking me for the dub, which, by the way, mm -hmm. to this day, I still get requests for that dub. Still, but I wasn't doing it for anyone because I wanted to keep it one away because of the historical significance and mm -hmm. sentimental value. So I say, all right, this is major laser we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'll do the dub for them. Do the dub for them, right? They're like, yo, we in Miami, you know what I'm saying? We're in Miami in the studio for a little while. So, you know, yeah, when you come back, you know, link us up. I'm like, all right, cool, no sweat. At this point in time, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to take my stuff, put it in a container, ship it over to Dubai and move there for a little while while I do this Dubnetics project because we're about to take off. Yeah. We had just got booked for a show in Lagos mm. um, in December. We did a show in Lagos, Nigeria, mm -hmm. alongside P-Square and WizKid. And yeah, it was wild. It was a, I'll get to that in a second. So That's crazy. So now, mind you, we're there, we're working. I just did a remix of a song with Wiley and Skepta. Um, this song called I, 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 it was a, a remix to it. I, I did a verse on it and it started playing all over, you know, the clubs in the UK and the clubs in Dubai and it's, it's slapping the place mm -hmm. with another tune called murderer, which was our first dubnetic single. We shot a video for it. The video was playing on MTV Arabia and you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, the real deal. Yeah. This thing was bubbling up. Nice. Mm -hmm. So boom, bang, no. I go back to Miami and I'm like, all right, I go back to Florida and I'm like, all right, I'm going to head back to Dubai in December, but I'm going to pack my stuff. Boom, boom, boom. All right. I go to Miami for the session with Major Lee's. The first day I walk into the studio, I meet Pharrell. What? And I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. this is about to be some shit. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Meet Pharrell, all right, yeah, boom. So I get, I set up in a little room, I'm working. At this point in time, Business Signals, watch out for this move my is the biggest hit Major Laser has, right? Yes. On fire, it's everywhere. I do a song called Come On To Me. This is a funny moment in my life. I did the song like it was mine. I'm like, yo, me get one, dog. That song, yeah, but come on. Ranch and me, Javi, as I young, glad <laughs> got me a boom. I mm -hmm. did the song, put the whole thing together, played it for Diplo and Walshi. They're like, Walshi loves the song. Diplo's like, you know, I never forget this moment. Mm -hmm. Diplo's like, you know, this would be perfect for Sean Paul. What in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, Sean Paul, mm -hmm. my son, this is my song. Mm -hmm. Then I thought about, I caught myself before I opened up my mouth. I was like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Angel Laser, Sean Paul, mm -hmm. this is a bag. That's going to go. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. He's like, yeah, I'm going to send it to Sean. Mm -hmm. Sends the song to Sean. Sean loves the song. The rest is history. 
Mm. Major Lazer, Sean Paul, come on to me. All right? Mm. They put it out on an EP called Apocalypse Soon. That yes. EP had that record. It had a record called Soundbang with Michel Montano, which ironically, I met him for the first time during those sessions as well. But something else happened mm -hmm. during those sessions. I wrote a, I wrote a song. It was a demo. It was actually supposed to potentially be for the Gully God. Okay. And um, it was just a random demo. And they ended up using the second part of the chorus for a song called Holla Out, which ended up on the Diplo and Skrillex meets Jack U album. Mm. And I got the feature credit, which was cool. Mm -hmm. um, so it was Diplo and Skrillex featuring Tarantula and Snails. Big up Snails, by the way. Um, EDM producer. Based in Canada, actually, Montreal. Okay. Um, Boom Bang No. That song goes on that album. That album ends up going gold. It's on its way to platinum. And it ends up winning Best Electronic Dance Grammy. That album ends up winning Grammy. So that was the first Grammy I got. Is that one of those on the, on the wall there? Yeah. yeah. It's actually that one. Mm -hmm. We'll get to the other one in a second. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, this hadn't happened just yet, right? They, they were just scratch vocals. Mm -hmm. I didn't even expect them to be used. Um, something else also took place that session. Diplo was like, yo, we're doing a cartoon, um, mm -hmm. a major laser cartoon. Yes. You should audition. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a knack for, you know, some voices and stuff. You should audition. So he puts me in touch with the producers of the cartoon. Mm -hmm. And, um, I do a quick audition. I send the audition over. They like what they heard. They fly me out to LA. I read for Major Laser mm -hmm. and a few other characters. And I end up getting about maybe four or five character voices on the show. I didn't get the Major Laser um, part. That was, um, oh God, what's the name of that actor? Adewale. He was in that old show on HBO as um, at a BC. I would call him at a BC. But <laughs> I can't remember his last name. Needless to say, he got the part mm -hmm. on um, of Major Laser on the cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I got like about four or five character voices on the show. And I ended up writing a bunch of songs for the cartoon. Um, it's on Hulu now. You know, whoever is listening, I want to watch it. I've seen a few episodes. One of the episodes I remember, the girl was looking to get high. And yeah, I wrote all of those songs. What? All of those songs. Um, there's one time when she goes to check the farmer. Mm -hmm. And you're the farmer. It's me, man. I am your weed, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote all of those songs. Bro. And then she ends up taking a seed, and the seed grows into a plant. And the plant is, like, haunted. She smokes it. She gets super high, and then the Trinidad James song that that you wish you never smoked. This comes. I wrote that song too, but um, yeah, that was um that was a fun time. Um, uh, J.K. Simmons mm -hmm. actually played um uh, a little girl's father in the show. Mm -hmm. He was like the president or something. Um, the actor John Boyega. He played a character. I think his name was Black Market in the show. There was a bunch of famous people, you know, like well-known actors at the time and even now that did voices on the show. That was my first experience with voice acting, which was a whole vibe. Um, so, so yeah, that takes place now. And I'm like, well, with all of this going on with Major Laser, I don't think I'm going to make you buy anymore. <laughs> Things are starting to get really <laughs> busy over here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So 2014 comes and I do a Europe tour with Poison Art, but in the midst of all of that, I'm also working with, um, I'm working with Michelle Montano. What? And we're doing a bunch of, you know, different soca records and, um, you know, I'm still working with Major Laser, working on stuff with them. And... 
Pee Wee gets back in touch with me and he has a young artist from Queens mm -hmm. that he's managing by the name of Cranium. Yep. And Cranium has a song called Nobody Not For Noah mm -hmm. that is slapping down the whole of New York City. Mm -hmm. Right? The song, like, it, it is literally running the streets. Mm -hmm. So... Kiwi puts me in touch with Crady and we start going back and forth with ideas. And um, I end up writing a song for him called Can't Give a Fuck. Well, if we can't have it up for me, I give a fuck, no way. Produced by LMR. It was on his first album, Rumors. Yeah. And um, at the same time, Kiwi also puts me in touch to where I'm working with Shaggy. And Shaggy and I begin, you know, going back and forth, writing ideas and things like that. So at this point in time, still playing the sound, mm -hmm. still doing custom dubs, writing for Cranium, writing with Shaggy, writing for Marshall Montano, writing for Major Lazer, right? So at this point, Mad Spider Productions, like I had to kind of put it on the back burner now. I didn't have the the time and the mental capacity to put together a juggling and you know what I'm saying? Again, something has to give because there's so had, much more you had to give. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So mind you later on that year, you know, as we're doing, you know, these different things, I start working with super dopes, you know, production, you know, writing wise, the full the circle project. moment. Huh? huh? A full circle moment. Full circle moment, exactly. Mm -hmm. I start working with dopes again, but in a different capacity. Mm -hmm. First project we tackled at the time was Holly Buds. He was working on an EP, which ended up being called Blue Dreams. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote two songs in particular for that EP. It was Prescription mm -hmm. and a Repeat. And, um, you know, those songs did their thing and, you know, it was fun. It was a good time. Mm -hmm. So Dupes and I begin working very closely back and forth and I'm going back and forth to LA and New York and all of these different things that I'm writing and I'm working, I'm working, I'm writing. I end up in, um, major laser studio in Burbank one day and I wrote a song and it was called one wine. And I was like, now I'm playing a and R. I'm like, you know, to select them, I'm like, yo, this would be perfect, Marshall and Sean Paul. Because how I like to write my songs is I just write the song, and then when it's done, I try to imagine who it could be for. You know what right. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, write the song, no, done the song. I'm like, yo, this is this is Marshall and Sean Paul. I link Marshall. Yo, got a tune for you. You and Sean. He's like, send it. I send the tune. He loves the song, right? Working with Marshall now. By the way, his studio is down the street from the low one in LA, you know? So Sean comes to LA at some point. We get him in the studio. They voice a song. It becomes Marshall, Sean Paul, Major Lazer, one line, right? Comes out as a single. They shoot a video for it and everything. Nice dance all soca hybrid situation, right? Um, Shaggy's in LA, comes by the studio. I do a verse for him for the Remedy remix. Marshall's song, Remedy, the remix with Shaggy on it. He got verse. Perfect. Right. Niceness. So we're working. Work on some other stuff. Fat Man Scoop. All kind of things is going on, right? Fast forward 2000. December 2014, I write a song called... <laughs> it's one of those things I'm not even sure I should be saying, but I write a song called Lock and Key, and that song ends up getting the attention of some, let's just say, an extremely well known pop artist. Okay. Right? And that starts off a whole chain of events that we don't even have enough time in all of our interviews ever we ever do to get into the <laughs> chain of events that happens. But um, needless to say, mm -hmm. Working with Marshall, February 2015 comes, we go to Marshall Monday. At this point, 
I can't even tour with the sound no more because it's customs, it's songwriting, mm -hmm. and everything is in full swing. And I just, like you said, something again mm -hmm. has to give. You see, but you see what's happening. It's getting smaller and smaller. It's smaller. And smaller. So the focus mm -hmm. is getting narrower and narrower mm -hmm. and narrower. Exactly. So 2015, working full swing with Masha, working full swing with Shaggy, and, um, you know, doing some sessions with Dopes. End up working with, um, let's see, which song did we do with Masha? We did Masha on Monday, mm -hmm. the show in Trinidad humongous energy it's insane shaggy and sean paul are down there it was a whole vibe mm -hmm. um there was a song with shaggy that was called picture that comes out does its thing mm -hmm. we do another one called um called i got you um with jovi rockwell that one does its thing and then with sean paul i end up writing another song Given Major Laser called Tip On It. Yes. Um, that song ends up getting all kinds of television syncs. I think it's in like Chicago Med or Chicago, one of them shows, you know? And that's when I learned what sync money was, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, is, which is a good thing. Um, so in the meantime, I'm still doing dub plates. At this point, custom dubs are like songwriting practice. Yes. That's essentially what it is. It's allowing me to quickly come up with lyrics on the fly. Mm -hmm. And I'm working with other writers and other producers. You know what I mean? Like, you know, Rock City and, you know, things of that nature. So we fast forward, end of 2015. I, um, I get a song. I get a song that was papered, do the paperwork. I learned a very valuable industry lesson here. Get a song, paperwork, upcoming Rihanna album. I'm like, oh, wow, this is going to be insane, right? So I'm lit now. I'm like, oh, shoot, we just did the paperwork. The album's coming. We about to be lit. <laughs> Don't know the track listing, but the album I come. We just did paperwork. We're going to have a song on there. And um, at the same time, I got in touch with a virgin of mine and we did a demo. I did a demo. It was called Don't Make Me Weak. Mm -hmm. And I remember sending it to Shaggy when I was finished. I was like, yo, this is you and a big singer. Like, I don't know, maybe a, I don't know, maybe a John Legend, maybe a whoever. I'm, I just, I hear you and a big singer. Mm -hmm. So he listens to the song. He likes it. And then he starts explaining to me the logistics about getting a star like a John Legend to First, you got to get them to record the song. Then you got to get them to sign off on it. Then you got to get them to shoot the video. He was explaining how logistically those things are almost impossible, especially with somewhere that statue when they're on fire. You know, all of me just came out. John Legend is out of here. Mm -hmm. So, mind you, this is around the, when I, around the time I do this demo is around the time I found out I'm nominated with the Diplo and Skrillex album. This is end of 2015, right? So all of this is happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, January 2016. I'm trying to keep this on a timeline so it runs smoothly because mm -hmm. doing it how, as I remember. January 2016, now, in LA, we're working on a cranium project. Um... The song we were working on at the time, Big Up Pooh Bear, was a song called Something to Hold On To. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bad song. Bad, bad Korean song. Right? So Shaggy's in LA, and um, he's like, yo, I'm extend the trip. You know, boom, bang. And the Rihanna album comes out, and we find out we're not on it. Mm. So at this point, I'm salty with the end. Yo, my backs, my backs, my backs. Salty with the end. Right? You think you're lit like, yo, yo I, I reach another level, boss. Yo, I was in my mind. I'm spending money that I didn't even get. Here. You know what I'm saying to you? I'm on Zillow picking out houses <laughs> with all kind of foolishness in my mind, right? Yeah. The album drops. Me through a sound, I make it. Damn. Mm. Mm. Ah. Bex. Now, mind you, this is end of January when Anti drops. By the way, this is the last album Rihanna, Rihanna dropped, you know, mm -hmm. right? Apparently, she's working on one now. 
lips are sealed. Anyway, mm-hmm. so that album comes out. We don't make it. We're in LA working on the Korean thing that, that ends up being done. Now I'm working with Shaggy. We're in the studio called The Village, right? And he's like, yo, you remember that song, Don't Make Me Wait? I was like, yeah, yeah I remember. He's like, you have the file. I'm like, bro, I always have my files on. You don't even got to ask. He's mm-hmm. like, all right, we need the session because Stig is going to come here and cut the chorus. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking to myself, now, mind you, I'm still salty about this whole Rihanna mm-hmm. thing, right? Mm-hmm. So in my mind, I'm like, seeing now, seeing how from my studio, man, it's about to be some industry bullshit. Here we go. Mm-hmm. You, you get your hopes up, thinking something's going to happen, and it don't happen. Mm-hmm. I give them the files anyway. They load it up on the big board. Within 30 minutes, Sting walks into the studio, mm-hmm. singing the chorus. Bro, this is my face. Oh, shit. <laughs> He's here. This is really happening right now. Mm-hmm. Bro, I run out of the room, and I call my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I call my parents. I'm like, you're not going to believe what the hell is happening right now. Mm-hmm. Sure enough, I'm like, Yo, Sting is here. I'm about to sing a song that I wrote, which I... Like crazy. Go back in the room. Him and Shaggy, you know, they stay they swapping stories about shows that they've done together. And, you know, he's there saying what up to everybody. He goes in, he cuts the vocals, lead background chorus is done, comes out, takes pictures with everyone, and he leaves. Totally surreal moment. I'm like, this did not just fucking happen. Mm-hmm. Right? That wasn't it, though. The night wasn't done. So after the session, we go and get something to eat. Because here's the thing with Shaggy now, right? Shaggy's like a big brother to me. Mm-hmm. So, like, we're like fam. So, you know, we're there apart. And sometimes I forget who he is. Mm-hmm. So we go, we go get something. We go get something to eat or something. He's like, all right, y'all just kind of decent. We're going to go, we're going to go crash a little party. I'm like, all right, cool. Mm-hmm. We go to this hotel over there in Hollywood, rooftop, penthouse suite. Walk into the party now, you know. It's like a scene in a movie, Entourage. And, you know, guys there, champagne. I'm like, okay, this is some ritzy Hollywood scene. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, I hear Shaggy. Oh my God. Bro, it was Regina King. Mm-hmm. Bro. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. We go to the back where all the party is happening. Mm-hmm. You got Regina King. You got Andre Harrell, rest in peace. You mm-hmm. got. MC Light, you got LL Cool J, you got, bro, all of these, I'm just looking around like, yeah, I be forgetting who he is sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now we stick around for like 15, 20 minutes, we hang out for a little bit, take a couple pictures, boom, 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 and we out, right? And then right after that, the Grammys happen, the Diplo and Skrillex wins best EDM Grammy, boom. And I'm like, see, one door closes, Others open. Mm-hmm. So at this point, songwriting's in full swing now. Customs are gone. Everything are gone. Not really playing the sound like that no more. And working on that one. So the Rihanna album comes out. And the work song comes out. And it does well, obviously. Clearly. Right. And... um what ends up taking place is Dooms and I get tapped to do a very, very small bit of work on a particular single called Signs that ends up being released as part of a Louis Vuitton campaign. Bro. The artist is your artist, Funa artist, <laughs> Drake. So now I'm like, okay. This like shit is really going like it's snowballing at this point. Very, very quickly. Right. So it's like, all right, we get that done. We knock that down. Small thing. Right. Mm-hmm. The song comes out. It's not even on no album or nothing, but it's straight. So it ends up going platinum. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just, it just is what it is. Uh, mind you, at this point in time, 
the Major Laser album, Pieces the Mission, with the original song that I did on Yellowbird Tuna, that song ends up being called Roll the Bass. Okay. Featuring myself and Randy Valentine. Hmm. And um, that album comes out. The hit single off of that was Lean On. Mm -hmm. And I have the, the plaque for that up there. That album goes gold. Hmm. And um, I don't even have all of my plaques. That's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. What they don't tell you is if the label doesn't issue the plaques, you have to buy them. I heard that. Um, yes. They don't tell you that. <laughs> I had to lead in and, you know, break the fourth wall. Like, yeah, that's what happens. But anyway, yeah. so work, I go on now, right? Full swing, like session after session after session. And we're doing work with Becky G. We're doing work with Estelle. I did like Estelle's last album was Lover's Rock. I did maybe, I did three songs on there. Right. Um, we're doing some work with Becky G. Mm -hmm. um, did some more work with Kali Buds, mind you. Mm -hmm. um, that song that he has, Love and Reggae. I just want to snow. Yeah, I wrote that. And um, so the songwriting thing is, you know, we're out of here. Mm -hmm. So um, we end up working on, what project was it? The word that Rihanna was going to do a reggae album starts to come out. Mm -hmm. And everybody and their mother is submitting songs for it. Mm -hmm. Used to say, if, when, where, how the album's done, I have no knowledge. Mm -hmm. I can't even speak on it. But when that word came out, everybody and their mother was working on that project. And, um, you know, fast forward, we're at 2017 now. Um, I take one more Europe tour you know, tarantula slash poison art, you know, just for the fun of it. Um, mm -hmm. we do Rotatum sun splash. I did Rotatum for the second time. Okay. Great experience. Um, this is when the Estelle album just drops the first single with the current Taurus love like ours that drops. Mm -hmm. So it's the, um, and you know, I was like, all right, this is probably going to be my last go around at this time, summer, 2017. You know, my mother's sick, big C, and, you know, things are kind of crazy at the time. And, you know, she ends up passing Thanksgiving Day 2017. Sorry to hear that, man. Yeah, absolute worst day of my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was so excited about the whole Shaggy and Sting project, but she didn't, she didn't get to see it when it came out. Um. What's insane about that is, is that shortly thereafter, it's, it's crazy how this works. And so many people in our industry have the same story. Yeah. It's like after the worst possible thing happens, things just get crazy after that. Mm. It's like you get a, a superpower. You get a guardian angel that just guides everything. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Life starts to move at like 200 miles an hour right after that like she passes november bro by january don't make me wait comes out shaggy and sting are on good morning america they're performing at the super bowl yeah. mm -hmm. they're performing at the grammys like they are everywhere twitter is like yo when did shaggy and sting become a thing like mm -hmm. you know it's like a shock to everyone because what ended up happening was sting caught a bug after that doing that chorus and he wanted to do a reggae album. Mm -hmm. So him and Shaggy started working together and they ended up doing so many songs. At first it was going to be Shaggy featuring Sting. And then he was like, you know what? Put the singing verse back on. Let it be Sting featuring Shaggy. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, they did so many songs together. They just like, yo, let's just shock the world and put out a joint album. And that's what ended up happening. Big them up. It was the opportunity of a lifetime. And it just, mm -hmm. it was God. It just came out of nowhere. And, um, you know, it, 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 it did its thing and it ended up winning best reggae yeah. album, which is that one it's over there. Second Grammy, bro. Right. You know, and, you know, I ended up getting two songs on that project and that was, that was a great time. It was just a bunch of legends, bro. It was, you know, mm. Brentford Marsalis and 
Rami Shakespeare and Esperanza Spalding and all different kinds of icons just coming in and out of the studio to contribute to the album. You know, that when you realize who it is that you're among, it's like, it, it's insane. Hmm. Um, right. But yeah, that was the opportunity of a lifetime. And, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful for that. So after that, it was, it was just full speed ahead, just nonstop work mm -hmm. on the songwriting tip. Now at this point, 2018 and 19, I'm slowing down on the custom thing because now I'm just, it's like full on industry work. You know what I mean? I'm working with, with her. I'm working, you know, doing some more work with Becky G, doing more work with Skip Marley, the Kali Bud song drops. Mm -hmm. Um, it's trying to balance the pop R and B reggae world with the dance hall at the same time. And mm -hmm. it, it was, it was an experience going back and forth. You know, we do some more work with cranium and like at this point, like I said, it's just all industry, it's all industry. I ended up with another song for Sean called only fans with him and Ty Dolla Sign. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I'm forgetting some of these placements. I ended up catching one with Tony Braxton. Okay. Yeah. Called Fallen. It was on her last album. Mm -hmm. um, that was fun. That was fun. It was like, yeah, I can do R and B too. You know what I mean? Because this industry has a way where they try to keep you in a box. Mm -hmm. If you let them. Just like, right. just like anything. Corner and say, this is the genre that we want you to do. And we want you to, mm -hmm. you know, but you kind of have to like, you have to fight and claw your way out of that because mm -hmm. everything works on categories with that. So if you allow them to, they will put you in a box. But yeah, it's, um, you know, just doing a lot of work, you know, super dope, Steven McGregor, you know, a bunch of producers and, you know, did some work, you know, Rodney Jerkins and, you know, and then in 2019 comes and, you know, do some work with Salon Remy. Um, Salon Remy put out a, like a remake of Cabin Stabbing with that super cat song, Push Crime. Yes, um, yes. Which was hilarious how that song <laughs> came together. But there was an Akon on the rhythm called One Time. Okay. Yeah, it was myself and Rock City that wrote that song. And um, yeah, man, it just it was just placement after placement after placement after placement after placement. They just they just kept coming and then the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. Everything slowed down. And the pandemic slowed down. Everything stopped. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even a code out jerk off. Yeah. It, it was it was a screeching halt. How <laughs> does but well, how does that feel as somebody that's been riding so high and everything just stops? Doesn't that like almost make you depressed or something like that? Like holy it's hard to handle that. Depressed depressed isn't even the word I would use, mm -hmm. but it was definitely yeah, okay. Yeah, disheartening, you know. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even say disheartening. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was definitely disheartening to an extent because you have a situation where it's like, you know, I, I had recently signed a pub deal with Sony mm -hmm. and, you know, I won't disclose the sum, but it was a very tidy one. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. things were like, you know, things were lit. You know what I mean? Lifestyle upgrade. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I work, I go on, you know, we, we outside clicking 18, 19. Um, those were the two least active years in terms of customs. Mm -hmm. I don't even think I voiced, I don't even think I voiced 10 for each of those years. Those and you were five. on fire before that fire, 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 bro. In 17 and 16, mm -hmm. I must have voiced uh, maybe a hundred to each year. I believe you. I totally you know, believe it. it was insane at that point, the output. But mm. yeah, when the pandemic came in, everything just came literally to a screeching stop. Nonetheless, it um a lot of things that were on schedule mm -hmm. to be released, labels just didn't know at what point. Like at one point it was like, okay, they're not touring. We can't recoup any of this shit. We don't even know if we want to put things out right now. So everything was literally on pause. It was literally like freeze frame. 
and it was like that for a little while and now it's slowly like you know we're pretty much for the most part 22 we're back into the swing mm -hmm. but even now it's still not like what it was before you know what i'm saying so you know needless to say you know the placement's kind of slowed down a bit and you're just grinding yourself back into the industry mm -hmm. and you know the sound them are clash again so you know the dog them are cut again you know and it's just been you know sailing from that point on so, you know what's so crazy about this story this is a little man from queens new york <laughs> that used to mix some artists on his dad's song yeah right and until this same little man mixing the artist on his dad's song is getting platinum plaques for writing music boss right you understand that do you do, do you ever one time really sit down and understand like I'll almost ask yourself, how the hell did we get here? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of surreal. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing is, and I, I've been told by friends of mine to, to make a conscious effort to do more often is interviews like this kind of help mm -hmm. you take a second to kind of stop and smell the flowers in a, in a way mm -hmm. where you're just like recollecting because when you're in the midst of it and you're just focusing on what you have in front of you and what you're trying to accomplish, like for, for a very long period of time, I, I still, to this day, I still feel like I haven't done anything yet. What? You know what I mean? Like I'm still in a space where I'm working to do mm -hmm. something special. I don't even feel like I've done anything yet, but it takes, you know, s moments like this conversation and moments with friends of mine where it's like, nah, bro you you you've done one or two things and you know you need to take a second and just acknowledge it you don't want the moment to pass you by and you don't give it the grace that you know it's old so to speak um but I actually, i'm thankful for this conversation i'm not gonna lie to you no man thank you because again as i told you off the ear i tried reaching out to you probably this was while the pandemic where we were in the middle of pandemic probably about a year or so you didn't, you didn't reach back, but I said, you know what? I know how these things go. Sometimes people probably don't want to talk now because that's when everybody was doing interviews. So you probably don't want to talk now. Cool. I'll get back to you later. Cause I knew you had a story to tell, but I had no clue boss. It was this crazy. Yeah. And on top of that, the way how you could articulate the story is even freaking crazier, bro. Yeah. Because I was, you know, knock on wood. I was blessed with um, a photographic memory. So mm -hmm. it's easy for me to like, you know, recollect certain things. Like it, it kind of sticks with certain key mm -hmm. events, you know, the thing is I can't remember everything all at once, <laughs> but, you know, when, when I do recall it, it's vivid, but it, yeah. like, it's never everything at once. It's always certain segments, but yeah, man, it's, um, it's been a hell of a ride. I'm not gonna lie, and we're still going. You know who's mm, who's yes. say who's to say what's next? Because there are things in the pipeline that I don't even want to speak on. Mm -hmm. That are, um, you know, at some point, hopefully sooner rather than later. Because with the industry, what's so interesting is you can write a song today. Mm -hmm. You know even for an artist directly. Sometimes you write a song and it's in a camp and the artist isn't necessarily in the room mm -hmm. and it ends up where you least expect it to, um, you know, but sometimes you're writing with the artist, you can write a song today and the song doesn't actually come out until like three years later. All the time that happens. All the time. So it, it becomes a situation where there are things in the pipeline. I don't know when, <laughs> or sometimes even if, they're coming out because there's a lot of projects that we've done mm -hmm. that that for one reason or another they haven't come out i'll just say as yet because mm -hmm. you know there's shit they could drop tomorrow for all you know you know what i'm saying like but it's one of those things where this industry is it's a funny beast at times um when it's good it's great when it's bad like during the pandemic mm -hmm. you start questioning your life choices <laughs> but you you okay with all of this crazy stuff that you did was your business always straight oh 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially, um, especially considering, you know, when I signed the um, the publishing deal mm-hmm. with um with Sony, it, it um, it's one of those things where when you have a major company like that that has a vested interest in your catalog, nothing untoward is going to take place. Mm. You understand what I'm saying to you? Because you know they they essentially give you you know, an, an advance or whatever, and it's on them to make sure it gets recouped, you know? Mm-hmm. So nothing untoward is going to take place at that point. And even before that, you know, I was fortunate enough. I didn't even mention this during the whole journey. I was fortunate enough at a very young age to, um, to get mentored on the ins and outs of the business. It was a, it was a producer by the name of William Hamilton. He was, he was the father of a schoolmate of mine mm-hmm. in, um, this is in New York, by the way, I was, I was living in Long Island at the time, you know, right on the border, Long Island and Queens. Mm-hmm. And I did like a development situation with him where, you know, I learned how to structure a song. I learned how to separate chorus from verse. I learned how to count bars and you understand what I'm saying to you and basics in production, MIDI, and synthy and how to sequence and what quantize means. I learned about publishing. I learned how to fill out a copyright form, you know, like ASCAP, BMI. He taught me all of those things. May you rest in peace now. But um, he was the man who taught me all of those things. And at this time, I'm like maybe 14. That's in Listen to me. You didn't even make any life choices yet. And you knew the business almost inside out. And you yeah. enter I mean, the business at, at, you know, as much as a 14 year old brain could understand, you know what I mean? Like certain legal jargon, like, mm-hmm. you know, obviously I didn't know, but at the same time I understood, okay, you need a lawyer to do deals like this and things like that. And if you do it under 18, then mm-hmm. you need parents to sign off because it goes into probate court and blah, 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 blah. I learned all of this at that point in time. He, um, he produced a very big hip hop record. He produced um two actually. He mm-hmm. produced Rob Bass um It Takes Two. Yeah, I wanna rock right now. I'm Rob Bass and I can't oh, no. produce that record and the other hit song that they had was Joy and Pain. He produced mm-hmm. it all. So he was already like lit at this point. Mm-hmm. And um I really I'm very thankful that he took the time out to to mentor, you know, me at that time. Cause I learned, that's when I learned the basics of the legal business side of the industry, you know what I mean? About royalties and, you know, and then as time goes on with experience, you, you know, you advance that knowledge, but I learned the basics with him. It seems like the practice ground for you was actually putting out the rhythm juggling and then yeah. the real deal when you got into the songwriting and all those stuff over there, that's where the real deal came in. It seems that way. Yeah. Um, it, it seems when you, I guess in a way, the way this interview is gone, now that I think about it, one thing definitely led to another. It was like, mm-hmm. it was like the experiences in one particular area end up helping you in another, you know what I mean? Which, which is important, I guess, because sometimes I wonder if, I'm moving fast enough or if things are moving fast enough. But when you look back at the journey, it's like, okay, this is why I wasn't supposed to skip any steps. This is why, you know what I mean? Like it was supposed to go at the speed that it went. So you could learn certain things. And mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm, I'm just grateful, man. Crazy. Cause I even wonder why your, your friend's father was even teaching this stuff in the first place. What was it that he saw in you to teach? Well, him? his son brought me to him. and was like, yo, he can rap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally what happened. He's like, yo, he can rap. He sounds really good. He has talent. You should listen to him. Mm-hmm. And his dad made me rap on the spot. And at that point, he just started working with me. You know what I mean? Um, now, granted, obviously, we didn't release anything. I, I'm not sure if it was like a pet project or Needless to say, but, you know, he took a liking to me and I was asking a whole bunch of questions and I learned, you know, I learned the basics. And it's funny because that was the first time I seen a computer in a studio doing recording. It was digital performer at the time. Okay. You know what I mean, Pro Tools wasn't even a thing yet. 
no, no, no. That came way later. Yeah, Pro Tools came much later. But at this point, this is like 93, 94. You know what I'm saying? 94. Yeah, 94 ish. And, um, but yeah, it was, um, I learned, like I said, a lot. I learned the basics. There's one thing I didn't get to ask you. I want to carry you back before we close this conversation. Squingy, no. Were you responsible in any way, shape, or form of naming Squingy the Michael Jordan of Soundclash? Yeah, that's what I called him. I've said it. I said it on a few different audios in Tampa. I don't know if I was the first, but I know I said it. And um, we used to have this thing because, you know, Squingy was an avid basketball fan. We used to have this thing, especially in Tampa. Um, I would call him Mike. He would call me Kobe. Mm. And, uh, you know, he used to, you know, when we would jump, we'd be like, yo, imagine Mike on Kobe by the same song. I'm like, you know, but it, yeah, yeah. I've said that on more than one occasion. I, like I said, I don't know if I was the first, but I know I said it. 100% mm. I know I said it. Still believe it, you know. Mm -hmm. Tarantula, listen to me. This conversation has been freaking nothing short of mad. I, I, I can't, I don't even have the words to articulate what I'm trying to say to you. Because again, we see the raster with the long, with the long locks on the stage. Yeah. Cause it's too bad word go about in business and the river. We <laughs> knew that you were into production. We knew that, you know, but we didn't know you were that deep. We knew about the rhythms that it was you, um, you froggy and um daily ranks put together. Yeah, we knew that. But the other side of the business, no clue. None. Yeah, man. Yeah. And it's one of those things where it's like people always say, friends of mine always say that I should talk more, but it's like for me personally, I'm more of a um just do the work. Mm -hmm. Just do the work and the results and the outcomes will do the necessary speaking on, um, you know, which is why I rarely do interviews. I didn't really feel like I had enough to say, mm. you know, but when you linked me, it was like, you know, yeah, this will be cool. You know what I mean? Let's have a conversation, talk about some things. Who knows? I might inspire the next person, you know, whoever that may be, which is also amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this, the production, the songwriting, um, the sound, the clashing, the juggling. Customs. Yeah. Yo, you know what's so crazy? I have, I've done, I can't tell you the exact number because I'm still obviously voicing, but mm -hmm. I can tell you with absolute certainty, I'm over 600. <laughs> $600, 600, 600 dances. So you can't be talking about customs. You're talking about 600 customs. I am over 600. I can tell you that. I can't tell you the exact number, but I can tell you with absolute certainty I am over 600 customs. That's insane, bro. Yeah. And, bro, like, and remember, September will make 11 years. I'm over 600. And remember, these customs are, these are real true customs as in, these aren't songs that you did somewhere else. These are customs, bro. Yeah. 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 It's, it's crazy. Like, um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. One point in time, I don't know when the hell it's going to be, but at some point, I don't know, maybe I'll, um, team up with some selected to do like an anthology. I don't know, but mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's well over 600. I don't even know how an anthology could be done. Mm -hmm. We will have to pick out certain ones of significance, but mm -hmm. yeah, man, it's while you're doing the work, you're not thinking about the, the amount you're just doing what's in front of you. If that makes any sense, it makes a hundred percent. And, and, and it takes a second where you look in mm -hmm. retrospect and you're like, okay, wow, that's a hell of a body of work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But I don't really think about it because. I tried my best not to, especially even after this interview airs, mm -hmm. I, um, because I don't want to get to the point where I feel like I'm resting on my laurels. Mm. Yeah. No complacency over here. Yeah. Got to keep going until you see where you're lucky with the customs is practically you have every single custom you ever voice. Most artists like a bounty or a beanie or something, they don't have those. They just got to hear it back from somewhere. 
You yeah, have crazy. I have I have most of them. Most of them. I lost the two first ones I did for the heavy hammer clash, that hard drive crashed and I never got mm -hmm. a to back it up. I don't have those anymore. Mm -hmm. Which sucks because I wanted to use that rhythm again. Now I gotta read beatbox to start up. I'll do it again at, at some point. But um, yeah, there's I would say maybe three or four that I don't have. But the rest, yeah. Yeah, I have them. We're gonna have to have a keep a custom listening party. Wow, oh, boy. <laughs> That's a long party, bro. <laughs> That's a long party. I um I told myself one of these days, mm -hmm. one of these days I told myself I was going to um I was just gonna go live on IG or Facebook and just mm -hmm. juggle all of the Matt Spider Productions rhythms. You know, just juggle all of the tune them. It would take like maybe a good 40 minutes, 45 minutes to juggle. I I hope that you do because if bruh. You there's so much you've done. The only other person I've sat down that gave me such a detailed chronological conversation interview like this was Delhi Ranks. He's mm -hmm. the only other person I knew that almost knew year for year. This is what we did, and he had it right down the line, like how you did this. Is freaking yeah, great. Yeah, you know, Delhi man. Delhi is hugely mm -hmm. instrumental in my career, mm -hmm. especially you know with the Max Spider. I learned a lot of things from him. About music and about life, um, dig him up and which part in there. Um, um, and you know, but a general, you know, Froggy, like, you know, he'll tell me, you know, on more than one occasion, like, yo, you know, like basically the work. What was interesting about the Trinity, as we used to call it, the three of us, mm -hmm. what was interesting was Max Spider Productions became a platform, it became a launch pad for each of us to launch into our respective ventures. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Delhi took off, you know, he was already, Delhi was already established, but you know, him took off on mm -hmm. this thing. Froggy took off, Bada General, the rest is history. And, you know, I went my particular direction as well. And it was one of those, it was one of those harmonious kind of things where it's like there was no acrimony. There was no, we knew going in that we were going to build something that was going to allow us to stem off and, and do, you know, our individual pursuits mm -hmm. and, um, you know, grace of God, it worked. It worked, you know, under the pause, you know? Yeah. But, Tarantula. Listen, been a hell of a ride, bro. <laughs> Holy smokes. Listen, I'm going to give you the last word here. Any big up, any shout out, anything else you want to say, leave uh, some contact information where they could check you out on social media, any of that. Social media is Tarantula, T-A-R-A-N-C-H-Y-L-A. -A -A. Um, that's Facebook, that's Insta Instagram, that's Snapchat. Um, I'm really on Snapchat. To be honest with you, I don't even post much on Instagram, but I do answer DMs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on Facebook a lot more often because... You know, that's why I'm talking smack of, you know, about football and all different kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's easy to get to me there. Um, you know, Mad Spider Dubs at Gmail for, you know, dub play requests and things of that nature. You know, most people know how to link me already. Um, big up sound system, culture, clothing line. Big up Acid. Big up Acid Sound. You know what I'm saying? Go check them out. Acid Sound on Instagram. They got the sound system, culture, clothing. This one is string up or shut up. There's a whole bunch of sound system related um you know shirts and sweatshirts and things of that nature i'm representing for them right now i love this shirt but um yeah man big up pies and not so and you know that's still my sound for you sure know, make no mistake why is not on my soul so you yeah. know you know big up the whole crew big up the whole family big up Bada general daily ranks big up super dopes um big up my wonderful canadian manager latoya webley um, yes, I have a Canadian manager, eh? Uh, okay, but hold on. <laughs> how, how, how dopes and yourself end up with Canadian managers and you guys are in America? How? We have the same manager. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we have the same manager. Um, yeah, we have the same manager. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we have the same manager. Big up Latoya, man. She's the greatest. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, man. Big up everybody. Big up Cardinal Official, man. Am I general Latino? Mm -hmm. 
Yo, you, yo, listen, man. Let me tell you something about Toronto, eh? Yeah. Let me tell you about. Let me tell you about how long I've been listening to Toronto hip hop. Right. Like, it didn't start with Drake for me personally. It was Cardi. It was Chocolate. Wow. And my favorite MC was Socrates. I knew you were gonna say I Socrates knew that he's not your boss, dog. You understand? He's far. Yeah. yeah, man. Big up Linda P. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, listen, man. This, my thing is, with this journey of mine, mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and, and, and delude myself into thinking I did this alone. No way. I am the product of multiple people's assistance along the way in various different ways they've made contributions. And I remember virtually all of them. And, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it wasn't just me, you know, mm -hmm. it still isn't just me. So, you know, it, it took a village, you know what I mean? It took a village and everybody played a specific part, you know, in, you know, where, where I've came from to where I am now, mm -hmm. you know, it, trust me, I don't have the time to do the whole Grammy speech. <laughs> you know, where you pick up every single one of them and then the orchestra music start to play, like wrap it up. Like, go, know. time to go. <laughs> yeah, you know, where they're trying to pan the commercial. I no, but nonetheless, um, yeah, man, it's been a hell of a ride, man. Dead. We're still going. Who's to say? Like I said, there's some things in the pipeline I don't even want to speak on right now that, mm -hmm. you know, you know, grace of God, they culminate and we may have to do another interview. Me, in my mind already, I'm trying to think, okay, when could I sit down with this man again? Yeah. In my yeah. mind, I have this already in my mind. Yeah. I, this was a little, this was a quite a um, lengthy conversation on um, pause. But yeah, this was a lengthy conversation. I, I don't know how many parts you're going to have to cut this into. No, man. <laughs> one thing, one thing I've learned with now, how this is what's happening. A conversation like this, you give them the full body of work, you put it out because there's people that want to listen from top to bottom, but then there's also, there's a lot of clips that you take out, right. out. but there's all, you always put out the full body and then your clips. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just see, I just learned something about podcasting. Yeah. Because you, when you look at the Joe Rogan model, when you look at freaking drink champs and all these guys. Yeah. They got the shorts. Yeah. Yeah. They got the mm -hmm. shorts. You have the long form and you have the short. Me personally, I like something long. So I'm just, even if I'm not really paying 100% attention to it, I have it in the background while I work. Yeah, Bluetooth That's speaker, you clean in your house and it'll play a same time. Right, right. Makes yeah. sense. Speaking on, speaking of last words, I do want to mention something. Mm -hmm. um, big up Dreddy, um, producer, bad, bad producer, um, you know, UK and um, working on a project right now. It will be, we're rolling it out in the next, give or take the next three weeks to a month or so. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a thing called Sound Clash, I, I, the Sound Clash six pack, right? Yeah. It's going to be a six pack of Soundboy tunes. Mm. I am of the belief that Soundboy tunes are necessary in this particular era of that song now. I think it's one of those things from the 80s and early 90s that would be cool to bring back. The era of artists doing 45s specifically mm -hmm. for sound. You know what I'm saying? Like how, you know, Johnny Osborne, the little soundboy, and you know, those kind of like soundboy tunes. You know what I mean? That's a straight song somewhere. It's like, you know, so. Can't even play up on 45 in a 45 clash or voice on dub soundboy tunes. I feel like it's a missing component. There's a lot of missing components of the culture for me. And we didn't even get into my opinions on the current state of things, but we can talk about that in the next interview. But yeah. Definitely, definitely leave that for, for the second one. Because again, this conversation is over three hours here. All right. Yeah. But plus, there's yeah. still a ton load. Of the thought that we haven't discussed, but yeah, the Soundboy songs are coming. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to drop them in six packs. Mm -hmm. um, I might even, um, <laughs> just to throw this out there, I might even make the logo, I might make the cover art like a six pack of Guinness almost. Yeah. You know what I mean? 
Have so you. then that's the original car. Remember when you're going to dance those times, it's six pack again, six pack yeah. again or whatever. Yeah, right? that's it. That's it. That's it. When I go to clashes, you know, ain't no, ain't no rose or no oh, really right. none of that foolishness, man. I ain't can I'm getting this, but and so and some dragon if you're not mind you. Yeah, some dragon if necessary. But yeah, man. Yeah, six pack. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it'll be coming out um next three weeks to a month or so. I'm I'm almost done with the recording and mixing and then we'll go into mastering and you know, it'll roll out. You'll you'll know because what I play you know how you roll out these kind of things. Mm-hmm. A couple of sounds get the dubs for some big dances, boom, boom, bam, the rest is history. I'm doing good. You know, you know what I'm really jealous of? Last thing I'm going to say to you are these two speakers in behind you. But you know what the hell these speakers have heard before? Or are they here on a daily? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. These two barefoot here? Bro. Yeah, man. These barefoots are something else. There's another set here. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you can see them that well. I'm kind of blocking everything. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, man. Yeah, these speakers have um, they've come a long way. They've they've heard some songs and they've heard some dubs. Yeah, a lot I'm of jealous. I'm jealous. Even, you know. even dubs for clashes that are coming up in the next month or so. <laughs> I don't, I don't know nothing or about two, next or three, mm-hmm. or five years. Who knows, right? Right. It, it's one of those things where it's like it, it. The requests are constant. At one point, I had to start turning down requests and it, it's it's insane plus the information that i get like you know people have various reactions to what it is that i say in these dubs just imagine what i don't say <laughs> and there's always i tell people there's always more the the juicy stuff is the stuff that's not said you right know? there are things that i get in these emails and messages where i'm looking and i'm like i'm not saying this like i am not gonna you can say this on the microphone over the top of the dub if you want to. Well, me and I got said something. No, mm-hmm. I was like, what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some of the things that I get is like, I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes I get information that has no place in clash. I'm just like, no, I'm not saying. It. Yeah, I'm not saying it. this ain't got no business in, in that. But other things, you know. But to be honest with you, mm-hmm. I will reveal this much. Yeah. As far as the formula, it is little tidbits of truth and most of it is made up which yeah. makes it funny because even the selector that's being dissed can laugh at it because he knows it's not true mm-hmm. you understand what i'm saying now there are there are some dubs that stick out where everything is true <laughs> but like i said we can do another interview just <laughs> talking about those things we that's a whole other hour and a half conversation no problem. I'm looking forward to actually having that one. But you know what? Let me give you an outro and get your other car, Tarantula. This has been one of the craziest conversations I've had in a minute, bro. <laughs> Easy. Respect. Don't know. Yeah, man. The man them are definitely going to rate this one, especially the the people that love song system, culture, that like production and stuff like that. This is a gem and a half. Yeah, respect, man. Give thanks. Like I said, it was it was great doing this. Um, you know, some of these some of these memories I haven't thought about in a very long time. So it was um, it was good just doing the whole recollection. Yeah, it was definitely good doing the recollection. I won't lie. But, no, thank, thank um, you. Give thanks. I give thanks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Muscle, and this has been another Two Line Music Huts Entertainment Report podcast, and we are out. Respect. This podcast is brought to you by www.twolinedmusica.com.